Section 26 of the San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire by Charles Morris. Chapter 26 Popocatepetl and Other Volcanoes of Mexico and Central America. Mexico is very largely a vast table-land, rising through much of its extent to an elevation of from 7,000 to 8,000 feet above sea level, and bounded east and west by wide strips of torrid lowlands adjoining the oceans. It is crossed at about 19 degrees north latitude by a range of volcanic mountains, running in almost a straight line east and west, upon which are several extinct volcanic cones, and five active or quiescent volcanoes. The highest of these is Popocatepetl, south of the city of Mexico and nearly midway between the Atlantic and the Pacific. East of this mountain lies Orizabo, little below it in height, and San Martin or Tuxtla, 9,700 feet high, on the coast south of Veracruz. West of it is Jorullo, 4,000 feet, and Colima, 12,800, near the Pacific coast. The volcanic energy continues southward toward the isthmus, but decreases north of this volcanic range. These mountains have shown little signs of activity in recent times. Popocatepetl emits smoke, but there is no record of an eruption since 1540. Orizabo has been quiet since 1566. Tuxtla had a violent eruption in 1793, but since then has remained quiescent. Colima is the only one now active. For ten years past, it has been emitting ashes and smoke. The most remarkable of these volcanoes is Jorullo, which closely resembled Monte Nuovo, described in Chapter 13, in its mode of origin. Popocatepetl, the hill that smokes in the Mexican language, the huge mountain clothed in eternal snows, and regarded by the idolaters of old as a god, towers up nearly 18,000 feet above the level of the sea, and in the days of the conquest of Mexico was a volcano in a state of fierce activity. It was looked upon by the natives with a strange dread, and they told the white strangers with awe that no man could attempt to ascend its slopes and yet live but from a feeling of vanity or the love of adventure, the Spaniards laughed at these fears, and accordingly a party of ten of the followers of Cortes commenced the ascent, accompanied by a few Indians. But these latter, after ascending about 13,000 feet to where the last remains of stunted vegetation existed, became alarmed at the subterranean bellowings of the volcano, and returned, while the Spaniards still painfully toiled on through the rarefied atmosphere, their feet crushing over the scory and black-glazed volcanic sand until they stood in the region of perpetual snow amidst the glittering, treacherous glaciers and crevasses, with vast slippery pathed precipices yawning round. Still they toiled on in this wild and wondrous region. A few hours before, they were in a land of perpetual summer, here all was snow. They suffered the usual distress awarded to those who dared to ascend to these solitudes of nature, but it was not given to them to achieve the summit, for suddenly, at a higher elevation, after listening to various ominous threatenings from the interior of the volcano, they encountered so fierce a storm of smoke, cinders, and sparks that they were driven back half-suffocated to the lower portions of the mountain. Some time after, another attempt was made, and upon this occasion with a definite object. The invaders had nearly exhausted their stock of gunpowder, and Cortes organized a party to ascend to the crater of the volcano to seek and bring down sulfur for the manufacture of this necessary of warfare. This time the party numbered but five, led by one Francisco Montano and they experienced no very great difficulty in winning their way upwards. The region of Verdure gave place to the wild, lava-strewn slope, which was succeeded in its turn by the treacherous glaciers. 
and at last the gallant little band stood at the very edge of the crater, a vast depression of over a league in circumference, and one thousand feet in depth. Sulphur from the Crater Flame was issuing from the hideous abysses, and the stoutest man's heart must have quailed as he peered down into the dim, mysterious cavity to where the sloping sides were encrusted with bright yellow sulphur, and listened to the mutterings which warned him of the pent-up wrath and power of the mighty volcano. They knew that at any moment flame and stifling sulphurous vapor might be belched forth, but now no cowardice was shown. They had come provided with ropes and baskets, and it only remained to see who should descend. Lots were therefore drawn, and it fell to Montano, who was accordingly lowered by his followers in a basket four hundred feet into the treacherous region of eternal fires. The basket swayed, and the rope quivered and vibrated, but the brave cavalier sturdily held to his task, disdaining to show fear before his humble companions. The lurid light from beneath flashed upon his tanned features, and a sulphurous steam rose slowly and condensed upon the sides. But, whatever were his thoughts, the Spaniard collected as much sulphur as he could take up with him, breaking off the bright incrustations, and even dallying with his task, as if in contempt of the danger, till he had leisurely filled his basket, when the signal was given and he was drawn up. The basket was emptied, and then he once more descended into the lurid crater, collected another store, and was again drawn up. But far from shrinking from his task, he descended again several times, till a sufficiency had been obtained, with which the party descended to the plain. THE VOLCANO HORUYO No further back than the middle of the eighteenth century, the site of Horuyo was a level plain, including several highly cultivated fields, which formed the farm of Don Pedro de Jorullo. The plain was watered by two small rivers, called Quitimba and San Pedro, and was bounded by mountains composed of basalt, the only indications of former volcanic action. These fields were well irrigated, and among the most fertile in the country, producing abundant crops of sugar cane and indigo. In the month of June, 1759, the cultivators of the farm began to be disturbed by strange subterranean noises of an alarming kind, accompanied by frequent shocks of earthquake, which continued for nearly a couple of months. But they afterward entirely ceased, so that the inhabitants of the place were lulled into security. On the night between the 28th and 29th of September, however, the subterranean noises were renewed with greater loudness than before, and the ground shook severely. The Indian servants living on the place started from their beds in terror and fled to the neighboring mountains. Thence gazing upon their master's farm, they beheld it, along with a tract of ground measuring between three and four square miles, in the midst of which it stood, rise up bodily as if it had been inflated from beneath like a bladder. At the edges, this tract was uplifted only about thirty-nine feet above the original surface, but so great was its convexity that toward the middle it attained a height of no less than five hundred twenty-four feet. The Indians who beheld this strange phenomenon declared that they saw flames issuing from several parts of this elevated tract, that the entire surface became agitated like a stormy sea, that great clouds of ashes, illuminated by volcanic fires glowing beneath them, rose at several points, and that white-hot stones were thrown to an immense height. Giant chasms were at the same time opened in the ground, and into these the two small rivers above mentioned plunged. Their waters, instead of extinguishing the subterranean conflagration, seemed only to add to its intensity. Quantities of mud, enveloping balls of basalt, were then thrown up, and the surface of the elevated ground became studded with small cones, from which volumes of dense vapor, chiefly steam, were emitted, some of the jets rising from twenty to thirty feet in height. These cones the Indians called ovens, and in many of them was long heard a subterranean noise resembling that of water briskly boiling. 
out of a great chasm in the midst of those ovens, there were thrown up six larger elevations, the highest being 1,640 feet above the level of the plain, 4,315 above sea level, and now constituting the principal volcano of Horuyo. The smallest of the six was 300 feet in height, the others of intermediate elevation. The highest of these hills had on its summit a regular volcanic crater, whence there have been thrown up great quantities of dross and lava containing fragments of older rocks. The ashes were transported to immense distances, some of them having fallen on the houses at Querétaro, more than forty-eight leagues from Horuyo. The volcano continued in this energetic state of activity for about four months. In the following years, its eruptions became less frequent, but it still continues to emit volumes of vapor from its principal crater, as well as from many of the ovens in the upheaved ground. EFFECT ON THE RIVERS The two rivers, which disappeared on the first night of this great eruption, now pursue an underground course for about a mile and a quarter, and then reappear as hot springs with a temperature of 126 degrees Fahrenheit. This wonderful volcanic upheaval is all the more remarkable from the inland situation of the plain on which it occurred, it being no less than 120 miles distant from the nearest ocean, while there is no other volcano nearer to it than 80 miles. The activity of the ovens has now ceased, and portions of the upheaved plain on which they are situated have again been brought under cultivation, and the volcano is in a state of quiescence. The crater of Popocatepetl, which rises to a height of 17,000 feet, is a vast circular basin, whose nearly vertical walls are in some parts of a pale rose tint, in others quite black. The bottom contains several small fuming cones, whence arise vapors of changeable color, being successively red, yellow, and white. All round them are large deposits of sulfur, which are worked for mercantile purposes. Orizaba has a little less lofty snow-clad peak. This mountain was in brisk volcanic activity from 1545 to 1560, but has since then relapsed into a prolonged repose. It was climbed in 1856 by Baron Mueller, to whose mind the crater appeared like the entrance to a lower world of horrible darkness. He was struck with astonishment on contemplating the tremendous forces required to elevate and rend such enormous masses, to melt them and then pile them up like towers, until by cooling they became consolidated into their present forms. The internal walls of the crater are in many places coated with sulfur, and at the bottom are several small volcanic craters. At the time of his visit, the summit was wholly covered with snow, but the Indians affirmed that hot vapors occasionally ascend from fissures in the rocks. Since then, others have reached its summit, among them Angelo Heilprin, the first to gaze into the crater of Mount Pele after its eruption. Eruptions in Nicaragua On the 14th of November, 1867, there commenced an eruption from a mountain about eight leagues to the eastward of the city of Leon in Nicaragua. This mountain does not appear to have been previously recognized as an active volcano, but it is situated in a very volcanic country. The outburst had probably some connection with the earthquake at St. Thomas, which took place on the 18th of November following. The mountain continued in a state of activity for about 16 days. There was thrown out an immense quantity of black sand, which was carried as far as to the coast of the Pacific, 50 miles distant. Glowing stones were projected from the crater to an estimated height of 3,000 feet. Central America is more prolific of volcanoes than Mexico, and the state of Guatemala in particular. One authority credits this state with fifteen or sixteen, and another with more than thirty volcanic cones. Of these, at least five are decidedly active. Tahumalco, which was in eruption at the time of the great earthquake of 1863, yields great quantities of sulfur, as does also Quesaltenango. 
The most famous is the Volcan de Agua, water volcano, so called from its overwhelming the old city of Guatemala with a torrent of water in 1541. Nicaragua is also rich in volcanoes, being traversed its entire length by a remarkable chain of isolated volcanic cones, several of which are to some extent active. We have already told the story of the tremendous eruption of Coseguina in 1835, one of the most violent of modern times. The latest important eruption here was that of Ometepec, a volcanic mount on an island of the same name in Lake Nicaragua. This broke a long period of repose on June 19, 1883, with a severe eruption, in which the lava, pouring from a new crater, in seven days overflowed the whole island and drove off its population. Incessant rumblings and earthquake shocks accompanied the eruption, and mud, ashes, stones, and lava covered the mountain slopes, which had been cultivated for many centuries. These were the most recent strong delays of volcanic energy in Central America, though former great outflows of lava are indicated by great fields of barren rock which extend for miles. End of chapter 26「Chapter twenty seven of the San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire, edited by Charles Morris. Chapter twenty seven The Terrible Eruption of Krakatoa. The most destructive volcanic explosion of recent times, one perhaps unequaled in violence in all times, was that of the small mountain island of Krakatoa in the East Indian archipelago in 1883. This made its effects felt round the entire globe, and excited such wide attention that we feel called upon to give it a chapter of its own. The island of Krakatoa lies in the Straits of Sunda, between Java and Sumatra. In size it is insignificant, and had been silent so long that its volcanic character was almost lost sight of. Of its early history we know nothing. At some remote time in the past it may have appeared as a large cone, of some twenty-five miles in circumference at base and not less than ten thousand feet high. Then, still in unknown times, its cone was blown away by internal forces, leaving only a shattered and irregular crater ring. This crater was two or three miles in diameter, while the highest part of its walls rose only a few hundred feet above the sea. Later volcanic work built up a number of small cones within the crater, and still later a new cone, called Ricotta, rose on the edge of the old one to a height of 2,623 feet. The first known event in the history of the island volcano was an eruption in the year 1680. After that, it lay in repose, forming a group of islands, one much larger than the others. Some of the smaller islands indicated the rim of the old crater, much of which was buried under the sea. Its state of quiescence continued for two centuries. A tropical vegetation richly mantled the island, and to all appearance it had sunk permanently to rest. Indications of a coming change appeared in 1880, in the form of earthquakes, which shook all the region around. These continued at intervals for more than two years. Then, on May 20th, 1883, there were heard at Batavia, a hundred miles away, booming sounds like the firing of artillery. Next day, the captain of a vessel passing through the straits saw that Krakatoa was in eruption sending up clouds of smoke and showers of dust and pumice. The smoke was estimated to reach a height of seven miles, while the volcanic dust drifted to localities three hundred miles away. Awful Premonitions The mountain continued to play for about fourteen weeks with varying activity, several parties meanwhile visiting it and making observations. Such an eruption, in ordinary cases, would have ultimately died away with no marked change other than perhaps the ejection of a stream of lava. But such was not now the case. 
The sequel was at once unexpected and terrible. As the island was uninhabited, no one actually saw what took place, those nearest to the scene of the eruption having enough to do to save their own lives, while the dense clouds of vapor and dust baffled observation. The phase of the greatest violence set in on Sunday, August 26th. Soon after midday, sailors on passing ships saw that the island had vanished behind a dense cloud of black vapor, the height of which was estimated at not less than seventeen miles. At intervals, frightful detonations resounded, and, and, after a time, a rain of pumice began to fall at places ten miles distant. For miles round, fierce flashes of lightning rent the vapor, and at a distance of fully forty miles, ghostly corpusants gleamed on the rigging of a vessel. These phenomena grew more and more alarming until August 27th, when four explosions of fearful intensity shook earth and sea and air, the third being far the most violent and productive of the most widespread results. It was, in fact, perhaps the most tremendous volcanic outburst, in its intensity, known in human history. It seemed to overcome the obstruction to the energy of the internal forces, for the eruption now declined, and in a day or two practically died away, though one or two comparatively insignificant outbursts took place later. Far-reaching destruction The eruption spread ruin and death over many surrounding leagues. At Krakatoa itself, when men once more reached its shores, everything was found to be changed. About two-thirds of the main island were blown completely away. The marginal cone was cut nearly in half vertically, the new cliff falling precipitously toward the center of the crater. Where land had been before, now sea existed, in some places more than one hundred feet deep. But the part of the island that remained had been somewhat increased in size by ejected materials. Of the other islands and islets, some had disappeared, some were partially destroyed, some were enlarged by fallen debris, while many changes had taken place in the depth of the neighboring seabed. Two new islands, Steers and Kalmire, were formed. The ejected pumice, so cavernous in structure as to float upon the water, at places formed great floating islands which covered the sea for miles, and sometimes rose from four to seven feet above it, proving a serious obstacle to navigation. On vessels nearby, dust fell to the depth of eighteen inches. The enormous clouds of volcanic dust which had been flung high into the air darkened the sky for a great area around. At Batavia, about a hundred miles from the volcano, it produced an effect not unlike that of a London fog. This began about seven in the morning of August 27th. Soon after ten, the light had become lurid and yellow, and lamps were required in the houses. Then came a downfall of rain, mingled with dust, and by about half-past eleven the town was in complete darkness. It soon after began to lighten and the rain to diminish, and about three o'clock it had ceased. At Buitenzorg, twenty miles further away, the conditions were similar, but lasted for a shorter time. In places much farther away, the upper sky presented a strangely murky aspect, and the sun assumed a green color. Phenomena of this kind were traced over a broad area of the globe, even as far as the Hawaiian Islands, while over a yet wider area the sky after sunset was lit up by afterglows of extraordinary beauty. The height to which the dust was projected has been calculated from various data, with the result that 121,500 feet, or nearly 25 miles, is thought to be a probable maximum estimate, though it may be that occasional fragments of larger size were shot up to a still greater height. A Graphic Description of the Eruption Another effect of a distressing character followed the eruption. A succession of enormous waves emanating from Krakatoa traversed the sea and swept the coast bordering the Straits of Sunda with such force as to destroy many villages on the low-lying shores in Java, Sumatra, and other islands. 
some buildings at a height of fifty feet above sea level were washed away and in some places the water rose higher in one place reaching the height of a hundred and fifteen feet at telok batong in sumatra a ship was carried inland a distance of nearly two miles and left stranded at a height of thirty feet above the sea the eruption of krakatoa seems to have been due to some deep-lying causes of extraordinary violence this appearing not only in the terrible explosion which tore the island to fragments and sent its remnants as floating dust many miles high into the air but also from an internal convulsion that affected many of the volcanoes of java which almost simultaneously broke into violent eruption we extract from dr robert bonney's our earth and its story a description of these closely related events the disturbances originated on the island of krakatoa with eruptions of red-hot stones and ashes and by noon the next day semeru the largest of the javanese volcanoes was reported to be belching forth flames at an alarming rate the eruption soon spread to ganunguntur and other mountains until more than a third of the forty-five craters of java were either in activity or seriously threatening it just before dusk a great cloud hung over ganunguntur and the crater of the volcano began to emit enormous streams of white sulphurous mud and lava which were rapidly succeeded by explosions followed by tremendous showers of cinders and enormous fragments of rock which were hurled high into the air and scattered in all directions carrying death and destruction with them the overhanging clouds were moreover so charged with electricity that water spouts added to the horror of the scene the eruption continued all saturday night and next day a dense cloud shot with lurid red gathered over the kadang range intimating that an eruption had broken out there this proved to be the case for soon after streams of lava poured down the mountain sides into the valleys sweeping everything before them about two o'clock on monday morning we are drawing on the account of an eyewitness the great cloud suddenly broke into small sections and vanished when light came it was seen that an enormous tract of land extending from point capuchin on the south and negeri passering on the north and west to the lowest point covering about fifty square miles had been temporarily submerged by the tidal wave here were situated the villages of negeri and negeri babawang few of the inhabitants of these places escaped death this section of the island was less densely populated than the other portions and the loss of life was comparatively small although it must have aggregated several thousands the waters of welcome bay in the sunda straits pepper bay on the east and the indian ocean to the south had rushed in and formed a sea of turbulent waves detonations heard from many miles away on monday night the volcano of papandayang was in an active state of paroxysmal eruption accompanied by detonations which are said to have been heard for many miles away in sumatra three distinct columns of flame were seen to rise from a mountain to a vast height and its whole surface was soon covered with fiery lava streams which spread to great distances on all sides stones fell for miles around and black fragmentary matter carried into the air caused total darkness a whirlwind accompanied the eruption by which house roofs trees men and horses were swept into the air the quantity of the matter ejected was such as to cover the ground and the roofs of the houses at denamo to the depth of several inches at first it was reported that papandayang had been split into seven distinct peaks this proved untrue but in the open seams formed could be seen great balls of molten matter from the fissures poured forth clouds of steam and black lava which flowing in steady streams ran slowly down the mountain sides forming beds two hundred or three hundred feet in extent at the entrance to batavia was a large group of houses extending along the shore and occupied by chinamen this portion of the city was entirely destroyed and not many of the chinese who lived on the swampy plains managed to save their lives they stuck to their homes till the waves came and washed them away fearing torrents of flame and lava 
more than torrents of water of the thirty-five hundred europeans and americans in batavia which for several hours was in darkness owing to the fall of ashes eight hundred perished at angers the european and american quarter was first overwhelmed by rocks mud and lava from the crater and then the waters came up and swallowed the ruins leaving nothing to mark the site and causing the loss of about two hundred lives of the inhabitants and those who sought refuge there the loss of life above mentioned was but a small fraction of the total loss all along the coast of the adjoining large islands towns and villages were swept away and their inhabitants drowned till the total loss was as nearly as could be estimated thirty six thousand souls krakatoa thus surpassed mount pele in its tale of destruction these two indeed have been the most destructive to life of known volcanic explosions since the volcano usually falls far short of the earthquake in its murderous results the distant effects of this explosion were as remarkable as the near ones the concussion of the air reached to an unprecedented distance and the clouds of floating dust encircled the earth producing striking phenomena of which an account is given at the end of this chapter the rapidity with which the effects of the krakatoa eruption made themselves evident in all parts of the earth is perhaps the most remarkable outcome of this extraordinary event the floating pumice reached the harbor of st paul on the twenty second of march eighteen eighty four after having made a voyage of some two hundred and sixty days at a rate of six tenths of a mile an hour immense quantities of pumice of a similar description and believed to have been derived from the same source reached tamatave in madagascar five months later and no doubt much of it long continued to float round the world series of atmospheric waves another result of the eruption was the series of atmospheric waves caused by the disturbance in the atmosphere which affected the barometer over the entire world the velocity with which these waves traveled has been variously estimated at from nine hundred and twelve point zero nine feet to one thousand sixty six point two nine feet per second this speed is of course very much inferior to that at which sound travels through the air yet in three distinct cases the noise of the krakatoa explosions was plainly heard at a distance of at least twenty two hundred miles and in one instance that recorded from rodriguez of nearly three thousand the sound traveled to ceylon burma manila new guinea and western australia places however within a radius of about two thousand miles diego garcia lies outside that area and rodriguez a thousand miles beyond it six days subsequent to the explosion after the atmospheric waves had traveled four times round the globe the barometer was still affected by them another result similar in kind was the extraordinary dissemination of the great ocean wave which in a like manner seems to have encircled the earth since high waves without evident cause appeared not only in the pacific but at many places on the atlantic coast within a few days after the event they were observed alike in england and at new york the writer happened to be at atlantic city on the new jersey coast at this time it was a period of calm the winds being at rest but unheralded there came in an ocean wave of such height as to sweep away the ocean front board walk and do much other damage he ascribed the strange wave at the time to the krakatoa explosion and is of the same opinion still in addition to the account given of this extraordinary volcanic event it seems desirable to give sir robert s ball's description of it in his recent work the earth's beginnings while repeating to some extent what we have already said it is worthy from its freshness of description and general readability of a place here sir robert s ball's description until the year eighteen eighty three few had ever heard of krakatoa it was unknown to fame as are hundreds of other gems of glorious vegetation set in tropical waters 
It was not inhabited, but the natives from the surrounding shores of Sumatra and Java used occasionally to draw their canoes up on its beach, while they roamed through the jungle in search of the wild fruits that there abounded. It was known to the mariner who navigated the Straits of Sunda, for it was marked on his charts as one of the perils of the intricate navigation in those waters. It was no doubt recorded that the locality had been once— or more than once, the seat of an active volcano. In fact, the island seemed to owe its existence to some frightful eruption of bygone days. But for a couple of centuries there had been no fresh outbreak. It almost seemed as if Krakatoa might be regarded as a volcano that had become extinct. In this respect, it would only be like many other similar objects all over the globe, or like the countless extinct volcanoes all over the moon. As the summer of 1883 advanced, the vigor of Krakatoa, which had sprung into notoriety at the beginning of the year, steadily increased, and the noises became more and more vehement. These were presently audible on shores ten miles distant, and then twenty miles distant, and still those noises waxed louder and louder until the great thunders of the volcano, now so rapidly developing, astonished the inhabitants that dwelt over an area at least as large as Great Britain. And there were other symptoms of the approaching catastrophe. With each successive convulsion, a quantity of fine dust was projected aloft into the clouds. The wind could not carry this dust away as rapidly as it was hurled upward by Krakatoa, and accordingly the atmospheres became heavily charged with suspended particles. A pall of darkness thus hung over the adjoining seas and islands. Such was the thickness and density of these atmospheric volumes of Krakatoa dust that, for a hundred miles around, the darkness of midnight prevailed at midday. Then the awful tragedy of Krakatoa took place. Many thousands of the unfortunate inhabitants of the adjacent shores of Sumatra and Java were destined never to behold the sun again. They were presently swept away to destruction in an invasion of the shore by the tremendous waves with which the seas surrounding Krakatoa were agitated. As the days of August passed by, the spasms of Krakatoa waxed more and more vehement. By the middle of that month the panic was widespread, for the supreme catastrophe was at hand. On the night of Sunday, August 26, 1883, the blackness of the dust clouds, now much thicker than ever in the Straits of Sunda and adjacent parts of Sumatra and Java, was only occasionally illumined by lurid flashes from the volcano. At the town of Batavia, a hundred miles distant, there was no quiet that night. The houses trembled with subterranean violence, and the windows rattled as if heavy artillery were being discharged in the streets. And still these efforts seemed to be only rehearsing for the supreme display. By ten o'clock on the morning of Monday, August twenty seventh, 1883, the rehearsals were over, and the performance began. An overture, consisting of two or three introductory explosions, was succeeded by a frightful convulsion which tore away a large part of the island of Krakatoa and scattered it to the winds of heaven. In that final outburst, all records of previous explosions on this earth were completely broken. An Extraordinary Noise this supreme effort it was which produced the mightiest noise that, so far as we can ascertain, has ever been heard on this globe. It must have been indeed a loud noise which could travel from Krakatoa to Batavia and preserve its vehemence over so great a distance, but we should form a very inadequate conception of the energy of the eruption of Krakatoa if we thought that its sounds were heard by those merely a hundred miles off. This would be little indeed compared with what is recorded on testimony, which it is impossible to doubt. Westward from Krakatoa stretches the wide expanse of the Indian Ocean. On the opposite side from the Straits of Sunda lies the island of Rodriguez, the distance from Krakatoa being almost 3,000 miles. 
it has been proven by evidence which cannot be doubted that the thunder of the great volcano attracted the attention of an intelligent coast guard on rodriguez who carefully noted the character of the sounds and the time of their occurrence he heard them just four hours after the actual explosion for this is the time the sound occupied on its journey a constant wind this mighty incident at Krakatoa has taught us other lessons on the condition of our atmosphere. We previously knew little, or I might say almost nothing, as to the conditions prevailing above the height of ten miles overhead. It was Krakatoa which first gave us a little information which was greatly wanted. How could we learn what winds were blowing at a height four times as great as the loftiest mountain on the earth, and twice as great as the loftiest altitude to which a balloon has ever soared? No doubt a straw will show which way the wind blows, but there are no straws up there. There was nothing to render the winds perceptible until Krakatoa came to our aid. Krakatoa drove into those winds prodigious quantities of dust. Hundreds of cubic miles of air were thus deprived of that invisibility which they had hitherto maintained. With eyes full of astonishment, men watched those vast volumes of Krakatoa dust on a tremendous journey. Of course, everyone knows the so-called trade winds on our Earth's surface, which blow steadily in fixed directions, and which are of such service to the mariner. But there is yet another constant wind— it was first disclosed by Krakatoa. Before the occurrence of that eruption, no one had the slightest suspicion that far up aloft, twenty miles over our heads, a mighty tempest is incessantly hurrying, with a speed much greater than that of the awful hurricane which once laid so large a part of Calcutta on the ground and slew so many of its inhabitants. Fortunately for humanity, this new trade wind does not come within less than twenty miles of the Earth's surface. We are thus preserved from the fearful destruction that its unremittent blast would produce, blasts against which no tree could stand and which would, in ten minutes, do as much damage to a city as would the most violent earthquake. When this great wind had become charged with the dust of Krakatoa, then, for the first, and, I may add, for the only time, it stood revealed to human vision. Then it was seen that this wind circled round the earth in the vicinity of the equator, and completed its circuit in about thirteen days. A VAST CLOUD OF DUST The dust manufactured by the supreme convulsion was whirled round the earth in the mighty atmospheric current into which the volcano discharged it. As the dust cloud was swept along by this incomparable hurricane, it showed its presence in the most glorious manner by decking the sun and the moon in hues of unaccustomed splendor and beauty. The blue color in the sky under ordinary circumstances is due to particles in the air, and when the ordinary motes of the sunbeam were reinforced by the introduction of the myriad of motes produced by Krakatoa, even the sun itself sometimes showed a blue tint. Thus the progress of the great dust cloud was traced out by the extraordinary sky effects it produced, and from the progress of the dust cloud we inferred the movements of the invisible air current which carried it along. Nor need it be thought that the quantity of material projected from Krakatoa should have been inadequate to produce effects of this worldwide description. Imagine that the material which was blown to the winds of heaven by the supreme convulsion of Krakatoa could be all recovered and swept into one vast heap. Imagine that the heap were to have its bulk measured by a vessel consisting of a cube one mile long, one mile broad, and one mile deep. It has been estimated that even this prodigious vessel would have to be filled to the brim at least ten times before all the products of Krakatoa had been measured. It is not specially to the quantity of material ejected from Krakatoa that it owes its reputation. Great as it was, it has been much surpassed. Professor Judd says that the great eruption of Papandayang in Java in 1772 of Skaptur Jokul in Iceland in 1783, and of Tamboro in Sumbawa in 1815, 
were marked by the extrusion of much larger quantities of material. The special feature of the Krakatoa eruption was its extreme violence, which flung volcanic dust to a height probably never before attained, and produced sea and air waves of an intensity unparalleled in the records of volcanic action. Judd thinks this was due to the situation of the crater, and the possible inflow through fissures of a great volume of seawater to the interior lava, the result being the sudden production of an enormous volume of steam. Extraordinary Red Sunsets The red sunsets spoken of above were so extraordinary in character that a fuller description of them seems advisable. A remarkable fact concerning them is the great rapidity with which they were disseminated to distant regions of the earth. They appeared around the entire equatorial zone in a few days after the eruption, this doubtless being due to the great rapidity with which the volcanic dust was carried by the upper air current. They were seen at Rodriguez, 3,000 miles away, on August 28th, and with a week in every part of the torrid zone. From this zone they spread north and south with less rapidity. Their first appearance in Australia was on September 15th and at the Cape of Good Hope on the 20th. On the latter day they were observed in California and the southern United States. They were first seen in England on November 9th. Elsewhere in Europe and the United States they appeared from November 20th to 30th. The effect lasted in some instances as long as an hour and three quarters after sunset. In India the sun and skies assumed a greenish hue, and there was much curiosity regarding the cause of the green sun. Another remarkable phenomenon of this period was the great prevalence of rain during the succeeding winter. This was probably due to the same cause, that is, to the fact of the air being so filled with dust, the prevailing theory in regard to rain being that the existence of dust in the air is necessary to its fall. The vapor of the air concentrates into drops around such minute particles, the result being that where dust is absent, rain cannot fall. As regards the sunsets spoken of, there are three similar instances on record. The first of these was in the year 526, when a dry fog covered the Roman Empire with a red haze. Nothing further is known concerning it. The other instances were in the years 1783 and 1831. The former of these has been traced to the great eruption of Skopter Jokul in that year. It lasted for several months as a pale blue haze and occasioned so much obscurity that the sun was only visible when 12 degrees above the horizon, and then it had a blood-red appearance. Violent thunderstorms were associated with it, thus assimilating it with that of 1883. Alike in 1783 and 1831, there was a pearly phosphorescent gleam in the atmosphere, by which small print could be read at midnight. We know nothing regarding the meteorological conditions of 1831. The red sunsets of 1883 were remarkable for their long persistence. They were observed in the autumn of 1884 with almost their original brilliancy, and they were still visible in 1885, being seen at intervals, as if the dust was then distributed in patches and driven about by the winds. Similar sunsets were occasionally visible for several years afterwards. These may well have been due to the same causes when we consider with what extreme slowness very fine dust makes its way through the air, and how much it may be affected by the winds. The Red Sunsets Described One writer describes the appearance of these sunsets in the following terms. Immediately after sunset, a patch of white light appeared 10 or 15 degrees above the horizon, and it shone for 10 minutes with a pearly luster. Beneath it, a layer of bright red rested on the horizon, melting upward into orange, and this passed into yellow light, which spread around the lucid spot. Next, the white light grew of a rosy tint and soon became an intense rose hue. A vivid golden aureole yellow strip divided it from the red fringe below and the rose red above. 
This description, although exaggerated, represents the general conditions of the phenomenon. On October 20th, 1884, the author observed the sunset effect as follows. Immediately after the sun had set, a broad cone of silvery luster rested upon a horizon of smoky pink. After fifteen minutes, the white became rose color above and yellowish below, deepening to a lemon color and finally into reddish tint, while the rose faded out. The whole cone gradually sank and died away in the brownish-red flush on the horizon, more than an hour after sunset. The time of duration varied, since on the succeeding evening it lasted only a half hour. These sunset effects, if we can justly attribute them all to the Krakatoa eruption, were extraordinary not alone for their intensity and beauty, but for their extended duration, the influence of this remarkable volcanic outbreak being visible for several years after the event. Though no doubt is entertained concerning the cause of the red sunset effects of 1783 and 1883, that of 1831 is not so readily explained, there having been no known volcanic explosion of great intensity in that year. But in view of the fact that volcanoes exist in unvisited parts of the earth, some of which may have been at work unknown to scientific man, this difficulty is not insuperable. Possibly Mounts Erebus or Terror, the burning mountains of the Antarctic zone, unseen by man, have prepared for civilized land this great spectacular effect of nature's doing. End of chapter 27. Recording by Kathleen Nelson, Austin, Texas. Chapter 28, Part 1 of The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Apfelstadt. The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire by Charles Morris. Chapter 28, Part 1. Mount Pele and its harvest of death. St. Pierre, the principal city of the French island of Martinique in the West Indies, lies for the length of about a mile along the island coast, with high cliffs hemming it in, its houses climbing the slope tier upon tier. At one place where a river breaks through the cliffs, the city creeps further up towards the mountains. As seen from the bay, its appearance is picturesque and charming, with the soft tints of its tiles, the gray of its walls, the clumps of verdure in its midst, and the wall of green in the rear. Seen from its streets, this beauty disappears, and the chief attraction of the town is gone. Back from the three miles of hills which sweep in an arc around the town is the noble Montaigne Pele, lying several miles to the north of the city a mass of dark rock some four thousand feet high with jagged outline and cleft with gorges and ravines, down which flow numerous streams gushing from the crater lake of the great volcano. Though known to be a volcano, it was looked upon as practically extinct, though as late as August 1856 it had been in eruption. No lava at that time came from its crater, but it hurled out great quantities of ashes and mud with strong sulfurous odor. Then it went to rest again and slept till 1902. The people had long ceased to fear it. No one expected that grand old Mount Pele, the slumbering, so it was thought, tranquil old hill, would ever spurt forth fire and death. This was entirely unlooked for. Mount Pele was regarded by the natives as a sort of protector. They had an almost superstitious affection for it. From the outskirts of the city it rose gradually, its sides grown thick with rich grass, and dotted here and there with spreading shrubbery and drooping trees. There was no pleasanter outing for an afternoon than a journey up the green, velvet-like sides of the towering mountain, and a view of the quaint picturesque city slumbering at its base. A peaceful scene. 
there were no rocky cliffs no crags no protruding borders the mountain was peace itself it seemed to promise perpetual protection the poetic natives relied upon it to keep back storms from the land and frighten with its stern brow the tempests from the sea they pointed to it with profoundest pride as one of the most beautiful mountains in the world children played in its bowers and arbors families picnicked there day after day during the balmy weather hundreds of tourists ascended to the summit and looked with pleasure at the beautiful crystal lake which sparkled and glinted in the sunshine montpellier was the place of enjoyment of the people of st pierre i can hear the placid natives say old father palais is our protector not our destroyer not until two weeks before the eruption did the slumbering mountain show signs of waking to death and disaster on the twenty third of april it first displayed symptoms of internal disquiet a great column of smoke began to rise from it and was accompanied from time to time by showers of ashes and cinders despite these signals there was nothing until monday may fifth to indicate actual danger on that day a stream of smoking mud and lava burst through the top of the crater and plunged into the valley of the river blanche overwhelming the guarin sugar works and killing twenty-three workmen and the son of the proprietor mr guarin's was one of the largest sugar works on the island its destruction entailed a heavy loss the mud which overwhelmed it followed the beds of streams toward the north of the island the alarm in the city was great but it was somewhat allayed by the reports of an expert commission appointed by the governor which decided that the eruption was normal and that the city was in no peril to further allay the excitement the governor with several scientists took up his residence in st pierre he could not restrain the people by force, but the moral effect of his presence and the decision of the scientists had a similar disastrous report. A graphic description by a sufferer. The existing state of affairs during these few waiting days is so graphically given in a letter from Mrs. Thomas T. Prentice, wife of the United States Consul at St. Pierre, to her sister in Melrose, a suburban city of Boston, that we quote it here my dear sister this morning the whole population of the city is on the alert and every eye is directed towards mont pele an extinct volcano everybody is afraid that the volcano has taken into its heart to burst forth and destroy the whole island fifty years ago mont pele burst forth with terrific force and destroyed everything within a radius of several miles for several days the mountain has been bursting forth in flame and immense quantities of lava are flowing down its side all the inhabitants are going up to see it there is not a horse to be had on the island those belonging to the natives being kept in readiness to leave at a moment's notice last wednesday which was april twenty third i was in my room with little christine and we heard three distinct shocks they were so great that we supposed at first that there was someone at the door and christine went and found no one there the first report was very loud the second and third were so great that the dishes were thrown from the shelves and the house was rocked we can see montpellier from the rear windows of our house and although it is fully four miles away we can hear the roar of fire and lava issuing from it the city is covered with ashes and clouds of smoke have been over our heads for the last five days the smell of sulphur is so strong that horses on the streets stop and snort and some of them are obliged to give up drop in their harnesses and die from suffocation many of the people are obliged to wear wet handkerchiefs over their faces to protect them from the fumes of sulphur my husband assures me that there is no immediate danger and when there is the least particle of danger we will leave this place there is an american schooner the r f morse in the harbor and she will remain here for at least two weeks if the volcano becomes very bad we shall embark at once and go out to sea the papers in the city are asking if we are going to experience another earthquake similar to that which struck here some fifty years ago the fateful eighth day of may the writer of this letter and her husband consul prentice trusted mount pele too long they perished with all the inhabitants of the city in a deadly flood of fire and ashes that descended on the devoted place on the fateful morning of thursday may eighth 
Only for the few who were rescued from the ships in the harbor, there would be scarcely a living soul to tell that dread story of ruin and death. The most graphic accounts are those given by rescued officers of the Roraima, one of a fleet of the Quebec Steamship Company trading with the West Indies. This vessel had left the island of Dominica for Martinique at midnight on Wednesday and reached Saint-Pierre about seven o'clock on Thursday morning. The greatest difficulty was experienced in getting into the port, the air being thick with falling ashes and the darkness intense. The ship had to grope its way to the anchorage. Appalling sounds were issuing from the mountain behind the town, which was shrouded in darkness. The ashes were falling thickly on the steamer's deck, where the passengers and others were gazing at the town, some being engaged in photographing the scene. The best way in which we can describe a scene of which few live to tell the story is to give the narratives of a number of the survivors. From their several stories a coherent idea of the terrible scene can be formed. From the various accounts given of the terrible explosion by the officers of the Roraima, we select as the first example the following description by Assistant Purser Thompson. A Tale of Sudden Ruin I saw St. Pierre destroyed. It was blotted out by one great flash of fire. Nearly forty thousand persons were all killed at once. Out of eighteen vessels lying in the road, only one, the British steamship Rodham, escaped, and she, I hear, lost more than half on board. It was a dying crew that took her out. Our boat, the Roraima, of the Quebec line, arrived at Saint-Pierre early Thursday morning. For hours before we entered the roadstead, we could see flames and smoke rising from Mount Pelé. No one on board had any idea of danger. Captain G. T. Mugga was on the bridge, and all hands got on deck to see the show. The spectacle was magnificent. As we approached St. Pierre, we could distinguish the rolling and leaping of the red flames that belched from the mountain in huge volumes and gushed high into the sky. Enormous clouds of black smoke hung over the volcano. When we anchored in St. Pierre, I noticed the cable steamship Grappler, the Rodham, three or four American schooners, and a number of Italian and Norwegian barks. The flames were then spurting straight up in the air, now and then waving to one side or the other for a moment, and again leaping suddenly higher up. There was a constant muffled roar. It was like the biggest oil refinery in the world, burning up on the mountain top. There was a tremendous explosion about 7.45 o'clock, soon after we got in. The mountain was blown to pieces. There was no warning. The side of the volcano was ripped out, and there was hurled straight toward us a solid wall of flame. It sounded like thousands of cannon. The wave of fire was on us and over us like a lightning flash. It was like a hurricane of fire. I saw it strike the cable steamship grappler broadside on and capsize her. From end to end she burst into flames and then sank. The fire rolled in mass straight down upon St. Pierre and the shipping. The town vanished before our eyes and the air grew stifling hot and we were in the thick of it. Wherever the mass of fire struck the sea, the water boiled and sent up vast clouds of steam. The sea was torn into huge whirlpools that careened toward the open sea. One of these horrible hot whirlpools swung under the Roraima and pulled her down on her beam ends with the suction. She careened way over to port, and then the fire hurricane from the volcano smashed her, and over she went on the opposite side. The fire waves swept off the mast and smokestack as if they were cut by a knife. Heat caused explosion. Captain Mugga was the only one on deck not killed outright. He was caught by the fire wave and terribly burned. He yelled to get up the anchor, but before two fathoms were heaved in, the Roraima was almost upset by the boiling whirlpool, and the fire wave had thrown her down on her beam ends to starboard. Captain Mugga was overcome by the flames. He fell unconscious from the bridge and toppled overboard. The blast of fire from the volcano lasted only a few minutes. It shriveled and set fire to everything it touched. Thousands of casks of rum were stored in St. Pierre, and these were exploded by the terrific heat. The burning rum ran in streams down every street and out to the sea. 
This blazing rum set fire to the Roraima several times. Before the volcano burst, the landings of St. Pierre were crowded with people. After the explosion, not one living being was seen on land. Only twenty-five of those on the Roraima out of sixty-eight were left after the first flesh. The French cruiser Suchet came in and took us off at 2 p.m. She remained nearby, helping all she could, until 5 o'clock, then went to Fort de France with all the people she had rescued. At that time it looked as if the entire north end of the island was on fire. C. C. Evans of Montreal and John G. Morris of New York, who were among those rescued, say the vessel arrived at 6 o'clock. As eight bells were struck, a frightful explosion was heard up the mountain. A cloud of fire, toppling and roaring, swept with lightning speed down the mountainside and over the bay and town. The Rorama was nearly sunk and caught fire at once. I can never forget the horrid, fiery, choking whirlwind which enveloped me, said Mr. Evans. Mr. Morris and I rushed below. We are not very badly burned, not so bad as most of them. When the fire came, we were going to go to our posts, we are engineers, to weigh anchor and get out. When we came up, we found the ship afire aft, and fought it forward until three o'clock, when the Suchet came to our rescue. We were then building a raft. Ben Benson, the carpenter of the Rorama, said, I was on deck amidships when I heard an explosion. The captain ordered me to up anchor. I got to the windlass, but when the fire came, I went into the forecastle and got my duds. When I came out, I talked with Captain Mugga, Mr. Scott, the first officer, and others. They had been on the bridge. The captain was horribly burned. He had inhaled flames and wanted to jump into the sea. I tried to make him take a life preserver. The captain, who was undressed, jumped overboard and hung on a line for a while. Then he disappeared. The Cooper Story James Taylor, a cooper employed on the Rorama, gives the following account of his experience of the disaster. Hearing a tremendous report and seeing the ashes falling thicker, I dived into a room, dragging with me Samuel Thomas, a gangway man and fellow countryman, shutting the door tightly. Shortly after, I heard a voice, which I recognized as that of the chief mate, Mr. Scott. Opening the door with great caution, I drew him in. The nose of Thomas was burned by the intense heat. We three and Thompson, the assistant purser, out of sixty-eight souls on board, were the only persons who escaped practically uninjured. The heat being unbearable, I emerged in a few moments, and the scene that presented itself to my eyes baffled description. All around the deck were the dead and dying covered with boiling mud. There they lay, men, women, and little children, and the appeals of the latter for water were heart-rending. When water was given them, they could not swallow it, owing to their throats being filled with ashes or burnt with the heated air. The ship was burning aft, and I jumped overboard, the sea being intensely hot. I was at once swept seaward by a tidal wave, but the sea receded a considerable distance. The return wave washed me up against an upturned sloop to which I clung. I was joined by a man so dreadfully burned and disfigured as to be unrecognizable. Afterwards I found he was the captain of the Rorama, Captain Mugga. He was in dreadful agony, begging piteously to be put on board his ship. Picking up some wreckage, which contained bedding and a tool chest, I, with the help of five others who had joined me on the wreck, constructed a rude raft, on which we placed the captain. Then, seeing an upturned boat, I asked one of the five, a native of Martinique, to swim and fetch it. Instead of returning to us, he picked up two of his countrymen and went away in the direction of Fort de France. Seeing the Rodham, which arrived in port shortly after we anchored, making for the Roirama, I said good-bye to the captain, and swam back to the Roirama. The Rodham, however, burst into flames and put to sea. I reached the Roirama about half-past two, and was afterwards taken off by a boat from the French warship Suchet. Twenty-four others, with myself, were taken on to Fort de France. Three of these died before reaching port. A number of others have since died. Samuel Thomas, the gangway man, whose life was saved by the forethought of Taylor, says that the scene on the burning ship was awful. 
The groans and cries of the dying, for whom nothing could be done, were horrible. He describes a woman as being burned to death with a living babe in her arms. He says that it seems as if the whole world was afire. Consolami's Statement the inflammable material in the forepart of the ship that would have ignited that part of the vessel was thrown overboard by him and the other two uninjured men. The grappler, the telegraph company's ship, was seen opposite the Eusine Guerin and disappeared as if blown up by a submarine explosion. The captain's body was subsequently found by a boat from the Suchet. Consul Aim of Guadalupe, who, as already stated, had hastened to Fort de France on hearing of the terrible event, tells the story of the disaster in the following words. Thursday morning, the inhabitants of the city woke to found heavy clouds shrouding Mount Pele crater. All day Wednesday, horrible detonations had been heard. These were echoed from St. Thomas on the north end of Barbados on the south. The cannonading ceased on Wednesday night, and fine ashes fell like rain on St. Pierre. The inhabitants were alarmed, but Governor Moutet, who had arrived at St. Pierre the evening before, did everything possible to allay the panic. The British steamer Rorama reached St. Pierre on Thursday with ten passengers, among whom were Mrs. Stokes and her three children and Mrs. H. J. Ince. They were watching the rain of ashes when, with a frightful roar and terrific electrical discharges, a cyclone of fire, mud, and steam swept down from the crater over the town and bay, sweeping all before it and destroying the fleet of vessels at anchor off the shore. There the accounts of the catastrophe so far obtainable cease. Thirty thousand corpses are strewn about, buried in the ruins of St. Pierre, or else floating, gnawed by sharks in the surrounding seas. Twenty-eight charred, half-dead human beings were brought here. Sixteen of them are already dead, and only four of the whole number are expected to recover. A Woman's Experience on the Rorama Margaret Stokes, the nine-year-old daughter of the late Clement Stokes of New York, who, with her mother, a brother aged four and a sister aged three years, was on the ill-fated steamer Roirama, was saved from that vessel, but is not expected to live. Her nurse, Clara King, tells the following story of her experience. She said she was in her stateroom when the steward of the Roirama called out to her, Look at Mount Pelet! She went on deck and saw a vast mass of black cloud coming down the volcano. The steward ordered her to return to the saloon, saying, It is coming. Miss King then rushed to the saloon. She says she experienced a feeling of suffocation, which was followed by intense heat. The after part of the Rorama broke out in flames. Ben Benson, the carpenter of the Rorama, severely burned, assisted Miss King and Margaret Stokes to escape. With the help of Mr. Scott, the first mate of the Roroma, he constructed a raft with life preservers. Upon this, Miss King and Margaret were placed. While this was being done, Margaret's little brother died. Mate Scott brought the child water at great personal danger, but it was unavailing. Shortly after the death of the little boy, Mrs. Stokes succumbed. Margaret and Miss King eventually got away on the raft and were picked up by the steamer Corona. Mate Scott also escaped. Miss King did not sustain serious injuries. She covered the face of Margaret with her dress, but still the child was probably fatally burned. The only woman known at that time to have survived the disaster at Saint-Pierre was a negress named Philote. She was found in a cellar Sunday afternoon where she had been for three days. She was still alive, but fearfully burned from head to toes. She died afterward in the hospital. Captain Freeman's thrilling account. Of the vessels in the harbor of St. Pierre on the fateful morning, only one, the British steamer Rodham, escaped, and that with a crew of whom few reached the open sea alive. Those who did escape were terribly injured. Captain Freeman of this vessel tells what he experienced in the following thrilling language. St. Lucia, British West Indies, May 11th. The steamer Rodham, of which I am captain, left St. Lucia at midnight of May 7th, and was off St. Pierre, Martinique, at six o'clock on the morning of the 8th. 
I noticed that the volcano Mont Pelee was smoking and crept slowly in towards the bay. Finding there, among others, the steamer Rorama, the telegraph-repairing steamer Grappler, and four sailing vessels, I went to anchorage between seven and eight, and had hardly moored when the side of the volcano opened out with a terrible explosion. A wall of fire swept over the town and the bay. The Rodham was struck broadside by the burning mass. The shock to the ship was terrible, nearly capsizing her. Awful Results Hearing the awful report of the explosion and seeing the great wall of flames approaching the steamer, those on deck sought shelter wherever it was possible, jumping into the cabin, the forecastle, and even into the hold. I was in the chart room, but the burning embers were borne by so swift a movement of the air that they were swept in through the door and portholes, suffocating and scorching me badly. I was terribly burned by these embers about the face and hands, but managed to reach the deck. There, as soon as it was possible, I mustered those few survivors who seemed able to move, and ordered them to slip anchor, leaped for the bridge, and ran the engine for full speed astern. The second and third engineer and a fireman were on watch below, and so escaped injury. They did their part in the attempt to escape, but the men on deck could not work the steering gear because it was jammed by the debris from the volcano. We accordingly went ahead and astern until the gear was free, but in this running backward and forward it was two hours after the first shock before we were clear of the bay. One of the most terrifying conditions was that, the atmosphere being charged with ashes, it was totally dark. The sun was completely obscured, and the air was only illuminated by the flames from the volcano and those of the burning town and shipping. It seems small to say that the scene was terrifying in the extreme. As we backed out, we passed close to the Rorama, which was one mass of blaze. The steam was rushing from the engine room, and the screams of those on board were terrible to hear. The cries for help were all in vain, for I could do nothing but save my own ship. When I last saw the Rorama, she was settling down by the stern. That was about ten o'clock in the morning. When the Rodham was safely out of the harbor at St. Pierre, with its desolation and horrors, I made for St. Lucia, arriving there, and when the ship was safe, I mustered the survivors as well as I was able, and searched for the dead and injured. Some I found in the saloon, where they had vainly sought for safety, but the cabins were full of burning embers that had blown in through the portals. Through these the fire swept as through funnels and burned the victims where they lay or stood, leaving a circular imprint of scorched and burned flesh. I brought ten on deck who were thus burned. Two of them were dead. The other survived, although in a dreadful state of torture from their bones. Their screams of agony were heart-rending. Out of a total of twenty-three on board the Rodham, which includes the captain and the crew, ten are dead, and several are in the hospital. My first and second mates, my chief engineer, and my supercargo, Campbell by name, were killed. The ship was covered from stem to stern with tons of powdered lava, which retained its heat for hours after it had fallen. In many cases it was practically incandescent, and to move about the deck in this burning mass was not only difficult, but absolutely perilous. I am only now able to begin thoroughly to clear and search the ship for any damage done by this volcanic rain, and to see if there are any corpses in out-of-the-way places. For instance, this morning I found one body in the peak of the forecastle. The body was horribly burned, and the sailor had evidently crept in there in his agony to die. On the arrival of the Rodham at St. Lucia, the ship presented an appalling appearance. Dead and calcined bodies lay about the deck, which was also crowded with injured, helpless, and suffering people. Prompt assistance was rendered to the injured by the authorities here, and my poor tortured men were taken to the hospital. The dead were buried. I have omitted mention that out of twenty-one black laborers that I brought from Granada to help in stevedoring, only six survived. Most of the others threw themselves overboard to escape a dreadful fate, but they met a worse one. 
for it is an actual fact that the water around the ship was literally at a boiling heat. The escape of my vessel was miraculous. The woodwork of the cabins and bridge and everything inflammable on the deck were constantly igniting, and it was with great difficulty that we few survivors managed to keep the flames down. My ropes, awnings, tarpaulins were completely burned up. I witnessed the entire destruction of Saint-Pierre. The flames enveloped the town in every quarter with such rapidity that it was impossible that any person could be saved. As I have said, the day was suddenly turned to night, but I could distinguish by the light of the burning town people distractedly running about on the beach. The burning buildings stood out from the surrounding darkness like black shadows. All this time the mountain was roaring and shaking, and in the intervals between these terrifying sounds I could hear the cries of despair and agony from the thousands who were perishing. These cries added to the terror of the scene, but it is impossible to describe its horror or the dreadful sensations it produced. It was like witnessing the end of the world. Let me add that, after the first shock was over, the survivors of the crew rendered willing help to navigate the ship to this port. Mr. Plusineau, our agent in Martinique, happened to be on board and was saved, and I really believe that he is the only survivor of Saint-Pierre. As it is, he is seriously burned on his hands and face. Freeman, Master British Steamship, Rodham The Etona Passes Saint-Pierre the British steamer Etona of the Norton Line stopped at St. Lucia to coal on May 10th. Captain Cantell there visited the Rodham and had an interview with Captain Freeman. On the 11th, the Etona put to sea again, passing St. Pierre in the afternoon. We subjoin her captain's story. The weather was very clear and we had a fine view, but the old outlines of St. Pierre were not recognizable. Everything was a mass of blue lava, and the formation of the land itself seemed to have changed. When we were about eight miles off the northern end of the island, Mount Pelé began to belch a second time. Clouds of smoke and lava shot into the air and spread all over the sea, darkening the sun. Our decks in a few minutes were covered with a substance that looked like sand dyed a bluish tint, and which smelled like phosphorus. For all that the day was clear, there was little to be seen satisfactorily. Over the island there hung a blue haze. It seemed to me that the formation, the topography of the island was altered. Everything seemed to be covered with a blue dust, such as had fallen aboard us every day since we had been within the affected region. It was blue lava dust. For more than an hour we scanned the coast with our glasses, now and then discovering something that looked like a ruined hamlet or collection of buildings. There was no life visible. Suddenly we realized that we might have to fight for our lives as the Rodham's people had done. We were about four miles off the northern end of the island when suddenly there shot up in the air to a tremendous height a column of smoke. The sky darkened, and the smoke seemed to swirl down upon us. In fact, it spread all around, darkening the atmosphere as far as we could see. I called Chief Engineer Farish to the deck. "'Do you see that over there?' I asked, pointing to the eruption, for it was the second eruption of Mont Pelé. He saw it all right. Captain Freeman's story was fresh in my mind." "'Well, Farish, rush your engines as they have never been rushed before,' I said to him. He went below, and soon we began to burn coal and pile up the feathers in our forefoot. I was on watch with Second Officer Gibbs. At once we began to furl awnings and make secure against fire. The crew were all showing an anxious spirit, and everybody on board, including the four passengers, were serious and apprehensive.' We began to cut through the water at almost twelve knots. Ordinarily we make ten knots. We could see no more of the land contour, but everything seemed to be enveloped in a great cloud. There was no fire visible, but the lava dust rained down upon us steadily. In less than an hour there were two inches of it upon our deck. The air smelled like phosphorus. No one dared to try to locate the sun, because one's eye would fill with lava dust. 
Some of the blue lava dust is sticking to our mast yet, although we have swabbed decks and rigging again and again to be clear of it. After little more than an hour's fast running, we saw daylight ahead and began to breathe easier. If I had not talked with Captain Freeman and heard from him just how the black swirl of wind and fire rolled down upon him, I would not have been so apprehensive, but would have thought that the darkness and cloud that came down upon us meant just an unusually heavy squall. Chief Engineer Farish's Story The Atona's run from Montevideo was a fast one, I think a record-breaker. We were twenty-two days and twenty-one hours from port to port. Off Martinique, I stared at the coast for about an hour, and then went below. The blue lava that covered everything faded into a haze that hung over the island so that nothing was distinctly visible. Through my glass I discovered a stream of lava, though. It stretched down the mountainside and seemed to be flowing into the sea. It was not clearly and distinctly visible, however. About three o'clock I went below to take forty winks. I had been in my berth only a few minutes when the steward told me the captain wanted me on the bridge. "'Do you see that, Farish?' he asked, pointing at the land. An outburst of smoke seemed to be sweeping down upon us. It made me think of the Rodham's experience. Smoke and dust closed in about us, shutting out the sunlight and participating a fall of lava on our decks.' "'Go below and drive her,' said the captain. "'And I didn't lose any time, I can tell you. "'We burned coal as though it didn't cost a cent. "'The safety valve was jumping every second, "'even though we were making twelve knots an hour. "'For two hours we kept up the pace, "'and then, running into clear daylight, "'let the engine slow down, and we all cheered up a bit. "'Captain Cantell visits the Rodham. Captain Cantell went on board the Rodham, whose frightful condition he thus describes. At St. Lucia on May 11th, I went on board the British streamship Robin, which had escaped from the terrible volcanic eruption at Martinique two days before. The state of the ship was enough to show that those on board must have undergone an awful experience. The Rodham was covered with a mass of fine bluish-gray dust or ashes of cement-like appearance. In some parts it lay two feet deep on the decks. This matter had fallen in a red-hot state all over the steamer, setting fire to everything it struck that was burnable, and when it fell on the men on board, burning off limbs and large pieces of flesh. This was shown by finding portions of human flesh when the decks were cleared of debris. The rigging, ropes, tarpaulin, sails, awnings, etc. were charred or burned, and most of the upper stanchions and spars were swept overboard or destroyed by fire. Skylights were smashed and cabins filled with volcanic dust. The scene of ruin was deplorable. The captain, though suffering the greatest agony, succeeded in navigating his vessel safely to the port of Castrier St. Lucia, with eighteen dead bodies on the deck and human limbs scattered about. A sailor stood by, constantly wiping the captain's injured eyes. I think the performance of the Rodham's captain was most wonderful, and the more so when I saw his pitiful condition. I do not understand how he kept up, yet when the steamer arrived at St. Lucia and medical assistance was procured, this brave man asked the doctors to attend to the others first and refused to be treated until this was done. My interview with the captain brought out this account. I left him in good spirits and receiving every comfort. The sight of his face would frighten anyone not prepared to see it. End of chapter 28, part 1Chapter 28, Part 2 of The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Apfelstadt The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire by Charles Morris Chapter 28 Part 2 the vivid account of Monsieur Albert. 
to the accounts given by the survivors of the rarama and the officers of the etona it would be well to add the following graphic story told by monsieur albert a planter on the island the owner of an estate situated only a mile to the northeast of the burning crater of mont pelet his escape from death had in it something of the marvelous he says Mont Pelee had given warning of the destruction that was to come, but we, who had looked upon the volcano as harmless, did not believe that it would do more than spout fire and steam as it had done on other occasions. It was a little before eight o'clock on the morning of May 8th that the end came. I was in one of the fields of my estate when the ground trembled under my feet, not as it does when the earth quakes, but as though a terrible struggle was going on within the mountain. A terror came upon me, but I could not explain my fear. As I stood still, Montpellier seemed to shudder, and a moaning sound issued from its crater. It was quite dark, the sun being obscured by ashes and fine volcanic dust. The air was dead about me so dead that the floating dusk seemingly was not disturbed. Then there was a rending, crashing, grinding noise, which I can only describe as sounding as though every bit of machinery in the world had suddenly broken down. It was deafening, and the flash of light that accompanied it was blinding, more so than any lightning I have ever seen. It was like a terrible hurricane, and where a fraction of a second before there had been a perfect calm, I felt myself drawn into a vortex, and I had to brace myself firmly. It was like a great express train rushing by, and I was drawn by its force. The mysterious force leveled a row of strong trees, tearing them up by the roots, and leaving bare a space of ground fifteen yards wide and more than one hundred yards long. Transfixed I stood, not knowing in what direction to flee. I looked toward Mont Pele, and above its apex there appeared a great black cloud which reached high into the air. It literally fell upon the city of Saint-Pierre. It moved with a rapidity that made it impossible for anything to escape it. From the cloud came explosions that sounded as though all the navies in the world were in titanic combat. Lightning played in and out of the broad forks, the result being that intense darkness was followed by light that seemed to be of magnifying power. That Saint-Pierre was doomed I knew, but I was prevented from seeing the destruction by a spur of the hill that shut off the view of the city. It is impossible for me to tell how long I stood there inert. Probably it was only a few seconds, but so vivid were my impressions that it now seems as though I stood as a spectator for many minutes. When I recovered possession of my senses, I ran to my house and collected the members of the family, all of whom were panic-stricken. I hurried them to the seashore, where we boarded a small steamship in which we made the trip in safety to Fort de France. I know that there was no flame in the first wave that was set down upon St. Pierre. It was a heavy gas, like fire damp, and it must have asphyxiated the inhabitants before they were touched by the fire, which quickly followed. As we drew out to sea in a small steamship, Mont Pelee was in the throes of a terrible convulsion. New craters seemed to be opening all about the summit, and lava was flowing in broad streams in every direction. My estate was ruined while we were still in sight of it. Many women who lived in Saint-Pierre escaped only to know that they were left widowed and childless. This is because many of the wealthier men sent their wives away while they remained in Saint-Pierre to attend to business affairs. What happened on the Horus? The British steamer Horus experienced the effect of the explosion when farther from land. After touching at Barbados, she reached the vicinity of Martinique on the day of May 9th, her decks being covered with several inches of dust when she was 125 miles distant. We quote Engineer Anderson's story. On the afternoon of May 8th, Thursday, we noticed a peculiar haze in the direction of Martinique. The air seemed heavy and oppressive. The weather conditions were not at all unlike those which precede the great West Indian hurricanes, but knowing it was not the season of the year for them, we all remarked in the engine room that there must be a heavy storm approaching. 
Several of the sailors, experienced deep-water seamen, laughed at our prognostications and informed us there would be no storm within the next sixty hours, and insisted that, according to all foxhole indications, a dead calm was in sight. So unusually peculiar were the weather conditions that we talked of nothing else during the evening. That night, in the direction of Martinique, there was a very black sky, an unusual thing at this season of the year, and a storm was apparently brewing in the direction from which storms do not come in the season. Great Flashes of Light As the night wore on, those on watch noticed what appeared to be great flashes of lightning in the direction of Martinique. It seemed as though the ordinary conditions were reversed, and even the foxhole prophets were unable to offer explanations occasionally over the pounding of the engines and the rush of water we thought we could hear long deep roars not unlike the ending of a deep peal of thunder several times we heard the rumble or roar but at times we were not certain as to exactly what it was or even whether we really heard it there would suddenly come great flashes of light from the dark bank toward martinique some of them seemed to spread over a great area, while others seemed to spout skyward, funnel-shaped. All night this continued, and it was not until day came that the flashes disappeared. The dark bank that covered the horizon toward Martinique, however, did not fade away with the breaking of day, and at eight in the morning of the ninth, Friday, the whole section of the sky in that direction seemed dark and troubled. About nine o'clock Friday morning, I was sitting on one of the hatches aft with some of the other engineers and officers of the ship, discussing the peculiar weather phenomena. I noticed a sort of grit that got into my mouth from the end of the cigar I was smoking. I attributed it to some rather bad coal which we had shipped aboard, and turning to Chief Engineer Evans, I remarked that the coal was mighty dirty, and he said it was covering the ship with a sort of grit. Then I noticed the grit was getting on my clothes, and finally someone suggested we go forward of the funnels so we wouldn't get dirt on us. As we went forward, we met one or two of the sailors from the forecastle who wanted to know about the dust that was falling on the ship. Then we found that the grayish-looking ash was sifting all over the ship, both forward and aft. Ashes rained on the ship. Every moment the ashes fell down all over the ship, and at the same time grew thicker. A few moments later the lookout called down that we were running into a fog bank dead ahead. Fog banks in that section are unheard of at nine o'clock in the morning at this season, and we were more than a hundred miles from land, and what could fog and sand be doing there? Before we knew it, we went into the fog, which proved to be a big, dense bank of the same sand, and it rained down on us from every side. Ventilators were quickly brought to their places, and later even the hatches were battened down. The dust became suffocating, and the men at times had all they could do to keep from choking. What the stuff was, we could not at first conjecture, or rather we didn't have much time to speculate on it, for we had to get our ship in shape to withstand we hardly knew what. At first we thought the sand must have been blown from shore. Then we decided that if the captain's figures were right, we wouldn't be near enough to shore to have sand blown on us, and as we had just cleared Barbados, we knew the captain's figures had to be right. Just as the storm of sand was at its height, 4th Engineer Wild was nearly suffocated by it, but was easily revived. About this time it became so dark we found it necessary to start up the electric lights, and it was not until after we got clear from the fog that we turned the current off. In the meantime they had burned from nine in the morning until after two in the afternoon. The engine became choked. Then there was another anxious moment shortly after nine o'clock. Third engineer Rennie had been running the donkey engine, when suddenly it choked, and when he finally got it clear from the sand or ashes, he found the valves were all cut out. And then it was we discovered that it was not sand, but some sort of composition that seemed to cut steel like emery. Then came the danger that it would get into the valves of the engine and cut them out, and for several moments all hands scurried about and helped make the engine room tight, and even then the ash drifted in and kept all the engine room force wiping the engines clear of it. Toward three o'clock in the afternoon of Friday we were practically clear of the sand, but at eleven o'clock that night we ran into a second bank of it, though not as bad as the first. 
we made some experiments and found the stuff was superior to emery dust it cut deeper and quicker and only about half as much was required to do the work we made up our minds we would keep what came on board as it was better than emery dust and much cheaper so we gathered it up that night there were more of the same electric phenomena toward martinique but it was not until we got into San Lucia where we saw the Rodham that we learned of the terrible disaster at St. Pierre, and we knew that our sand was lava dust. The volcanic ash which fell on the decks of the Horus was ground as fine as rifle powder, and was much finer than that which covered the decks of the Etona. Returning to the stories told by officers of the Royama, of which a number had been given, it seems desirable to add here the narrative of Ellery S. Scott, the mate of the ruined ship, since it gives a vivid and striking account of his personal experience of the frightful disaster, with many details of interest not related by others. Mate Scott's graphic story. We got to Saint-Pierre in the Royama, began Mr. Scott, at six-thirty in the morning on Thursday morning. That's the morning the mountain and the town and the ships were all sent to hell in a minute. All hands had breakfast. I was standing on the forecastle head, trying to make out the marks of the pipes on a ship way out and heading for San Lucia. I wasn't looking at the mountain at all, but I guess the captain was, for he was on the bridge, and the last time I heard him speak was when he shouted, Heave up, Mr. Scott, heave up! I gave the order to the men, and I think some of them did jump to get the anchor up. But nobody knows what really happened for the next fifteen minutes. I turned around toward the captain, and then I saw the mountain. Did you ever see the tide come into the Bay of Fundy? It doesn't sneak in a little at a time as it does round here. It rolls in in waves. That's the way the cloud of fire and mud and white-hot stones rolled down from the volcano, over the town and over the ships. It was on us in almost no time, but I saw it, and in the same glance I saw our captain bracing himself to meet it on the bridge. He was facing the fire cloud with both hands gripped hard to the bridge rail, his legs apart, and his knees braced back stiff. I've seen him brace himself that same way many a time in a tough sea, with the spray going masthead high and green water pouring along the decks. I saw the captain, I say, at the same instant I saw that ruin coming down upon us. I don't know why, but that last glimpse of poor Mugga on his bridge will stay with me just as long as I remember Saint-Pierre, and that will be long enough. In another instant it was all over for him. As I was looking at him, he was all ablaze. He reeled and fell on the bridge with his face towards me. His mustache and eyebrows were gone in a jiffy. His hat was gone, and his hair was aflame, and so were his clothes from head to foot. I knew he was conscious when he fell by the look in his eyes, but he didn't make a sound. That all happened a long way inside of half a minute. Then something new happened. When the wave of fire was going over us, a tidal wave of the sea came out from the shore and did the rest. That wall of rushing water was so high and so solid it seemed to rise up and join the smoke and flame above. For an instant we could see nothing but the water and the flame. That tidal wave picked the ship up like a canoe and then smashed her. After one list to starboard, the ship righted, but the masts, the bridge, the funnel, and all the upper works had gone overboard. I had saved myself from fire by jamming a metal ventilator cover over my head and jumping from the forecastle head. Two St. Kit Negroes saved me from the water by grabbing me by the legs and pulling me down into the forecastle after them. Before I could get up, three men tumbled in on top of me. Two of them were dead. Captain Mugga went overboard, still clinging to the fragments of his wrecked bridge. Daniel Taylor, the ship's cooper, and a Kitts native jumped overboard to save him. Taylor managed to push the captain onto a hatch that had floated off from us, and then they swam back to the ship for more assistance, but nothing could be done for the captain. Taylor wasn't sure he was alive. The last we saw of him or his dead body, it was drifting shoreward on that hatch. Well, after staying in the forecastle about twenty minutes, I went out on the deck. There were just four of us left aboard who could do anything. The four were Thompson, Dan Taylor, Quashi, and myself. It was still raining fire and hot rocks, and you could hardly see a ship's length for dust and ashes, but we could stand that. 
there were burning men and some women and two or three children lying around the deck, not just burned, but burning, then, when we got to them. More than half of the ship's company had been killed in that first rush of flame. Some had rolled overboard when the tidal wave came, and we never saw so much as their bodies. The cook was burned to death in his galley. He had been paring potatoes for dinner, and what was left of his right hand held the shank of his potato knife. The wooden handle was in ashes. All of that happened to a man in less than a minute. The donkey engineman was killed on deck sitting in front of his boiler. We found parts of somebody's, a hand or an arm or a leg. Below decks there were some twenty alive. The ship was on fire, of course, what was left of it. The stumps of both masts were blazing. Aft she was like a furnace, but forward the flames had not got below deck. So we four carried those who were still alive on deck into the forecastle. All of them were burned, and most of them were half-strangled. One boy, a passenger, and just a little shaver, the four-year-old son of the late Clement Stokes, above spoken of, was picked up naked. His hair and all his clothing had been burned off, but he was alive. We rolled him in a blanket and put him in a sailor's bunk. A few minutes later we looked at him, and he was dead. My own son's gone, too. It had been his trick at lookout during the dog watch that morning, when we were making for Saint-Pierre, so I supposed at first when the fire struck us that he was asleep in his bunk and safe, but he wasn't. Nobody could tell me where he was. I don't know whether he was burned to death or rolled overboard and drowned. He was a likely boy. He had been several voyages with me and would have been a master some day. He used to say how he'd make me mate. After getting all hands that had any life left in them below, and tended to it best we could, the four of us that were left halfway ship-shape started in to fight the fire. We had case oil stowed aboard. Thanks to that tidal wave that cleared out our decks, there wasn't much left to burn. So we got the fire down so as we could live on board with it for several hours more, and then the four turned to knock a raft together out of what timber and truck we could find below. Our boats had gone overboard with the masts and funnel. Prepared to trust to luck, we made that raft for something over thirty that were alive. We put provisions on for two days and rigged up a makeshift mast and sail, for we intended to go to sea. We were only three boat lengths from shore, but the shore was hell itself. We intended to put straight out and trust to luck that the corona that was about due at Saint-Pierre would pick us up. But we did not have to risk the raft, for about three o'clock in the afternoon, when we were almost ready to put the raft overboard, the Suchet came along and took us all off. We thought for a minute, just after we were wrecked, that we were to get help from a ship that passed us. We burned blue lights, but she kept on. We learned afterward that she was the Rodham. Soundings made off Martinique after the explosion showed that the earthquake effects of much importance had taken place under the sea bottom, which had been lifted in some places and had sunk in others. While deep crevices had been formed on the land, a still greater effect had seemingly been produced beneath the water. During the explosion, the sea withdrew several hundred feet from its shoreline. Then it came back steaming with fury this indicating a lift and a fall of the ocean bed off the isle. Soundings made subsequently near the island found one place a depth of 4,000 feet, where before it had only been 600 feet deep. The French cable company, which was at work trying to repair the cables broken by the eruption, found the bottom of the Caribbean Sea so changed as to render the old charts useless. New charts will need to be made up for future navigation. The changes in sea level were not confined to the immediate center of the volcanic activity, but extended as far north as Puerto Rico, and it was believed that the seismic wave would be found to have altered the ocean bed around Jamaica. Vessels plying between St. Thomas, Martinique, and St. Lucia and other islands found it necessary to heave the lead while many miles at sea. It is estimated that the sea had encroached from 10 feet to 2 miles along the coast of St. Vincent near Georgetown, and that a section on the north end of the island had dropped into the sea. Soundings showed 7 fathoms, where before the eruption there were 36 fathoms of water. 
vessels that endeavored to approach st vincent toward the north reported that it was impossible to get nearer than eight miles to the scene of the catastrophe and that at that distance the ocean was seriously perturbed as from a submarine volcano boiling and hissing continuously in this connection the remarkable experience reported by the officers of the danish ship nordby on the day preceding the eruption is of much interest as seemingly to show great convulsions of the sea bottom at a point several hundred miles from martinique the following is the story told by captain eric lilianskjold the strange experience of the nordby on may fifth the captain said we touched at st michael's for water we had had an easy voyage from Girgenti in Sicily, and we wanted to finish an easy run up here. We left St. Michael's on the same day. Nothing worthwhile talking about occurred until two days afterwards, Wednesday, May 7th. We were plodding along slowly that day. About noon I took the bridge to make an observation. It seemed to be hotter than ordinary. I shed my coat and vest and got into what little shade there was. As I worked, it grew hotter and hotter. I didn't know what to make of it. Along about two o'clock in the afternoon, it was so hot that all hands got to talking about it. We reckoned that something queer was coming off, but none of us could explain what it was. You could almost see the pitch softening in the seams. Then, as quick as you could toss a biscuit over its rail, the Nordby dropped, regularly dropped three or four feet down into the sea. No sooner did it do this than big waves that looked like they were coming from all directions at once began to smash against our sides. This was queerer yet, because the water a minute before had been as smooth as I ever saw it. I had all hands piped on deck, and we battened down everything loose to make ready for a storm. And we got it all right, the strangest storm you ever heard of. There was something wrong with the sun that afternoon. It grew red and then dark red, and then, about a quarter to two, it went out of sight altogether. The day got so dark you couldn't see a half a ship's length ahead of you. We got our lamps going, put on our oilskins, ready for a hurricane. All of a sudden there came a sheet of lightning that showed up the whole tumbling sea for miles and miles. We sort of ducked, expecting an awful crash of thunder, but it didn't come. There was no sound except the big waves pounding against our sides. There wasn't a breath of wind. Well, sir, at that minute there began the most exciting time I've ever been through, and I've been on every sea on the map for twenty-five years. Every second there'd be waves fifteen or twenty feet high, belting us head on, stern on, and broadside all at once. We could see them coming, for without any stop at all, flash after flash of lightning was blazing all about us. Something else we could see, too, sharks. There were hundreds of them on all sides, jumping up and down in the water. Some of them jumped clear out of it, and seabirds... A flock of them, squawking and crying, made for our rigging and perch there. They seemed like they were scared to death. But the queerest part of it all was the water itself. It was hot. Not so hot that our feet couldn't stand it when it washed over the deck, but hot enough to make us think it had been heated by some kind of a fire. Well, that sort of thing went on hour after hour. The waves, the lightning, the hot water, and the sharks, and all the rest of the odd things happening frightened the crew out of their wits. Some of them prayed out loud, I guess the first time they ever did so in their lives. Some Frenchmen aboard kept running around and yelling, C'est la dernière jour. This is the last day. We were all worried. Even the officers began to think that the world was coming to an end. Mighty strange things happen on the sea, but this topped them all. I kept to the bridge all night. When the first hour of morning came, the storm was still going on. We were all pretty much tired out by that time, but there was no such thing as trying to sleep. The waves were still batting us around, and we didn't know whether we were one mile or a thousand miles from shore. At two o'clock in the morning, all the queer goings-on stopped just the way they began, all of a sudden. We lay to until daylight, then we took our reckonings and started off again. We were about 700 miles off Cape Henlopen. No, sir, you couldn't get me to go through a thing like that again for $10,000. None of us was hurt, and the old Nordby herself pulled through all right, but I'd sooner stay ashore than see waves without wind and lightning without thunder. Fiery Stream Contained Poisonous Gases 
Careful inspection showed that the fiery stream which so completely destroyed St. Pierre must have been composed of poisonous gases, which instantly suffocated everyone who inhaled them, and of other gases burning furiously, for nearly all the victims had their hands covering their mouths, or were in some other attitude showing they had perished from suffocation. It is believed that Mount Pelee threw off a great gasp of some exceedingly heavy and noxious gas, something akin to fire damp, which settled upon the city and rendered the inhabitants insensible. This was followed by the sheet of flame that swept down the side of the mountain. This theory is sustained by the experience of the survivors who were taken from the ships in the harbor, as they say their first experience was one of faintness. The dumb animals were wiser than man, and early took warning of the storm of fire which Mount Pele was storing up to hurl upon the island. Even before the mountain began to rumble, late in April, livestock became uneasy, and at times were almost uncontrollable. Cattle lowed in the night, dogs howled, and sought the company of their masters, and when driven forth they gave every evidence of fear. Wild animals disappeared from the vicinity of Mount Pele, even the snakes, which at ordinary times are found in great numbers near the volcano, crawled away. Birds ceased singing, and left the trees that shaded the sides of Pele. A great fear seemed to be upon the island, and though it was shared by the human inhabitants, they alone neglected to protect themselves. Of the villages in the vicinity of Saint-Pierre, only one escaped, the other suffering the fate of the city. The fortunate one was Le Carbet on the south, which escaped uninjured, the flood of lava stopping when within two hundred feet of the town. Mont Rouge, a beautiful summer resort frequented by the people of the island during the hot season as a place of recreation, also escaped. In the height of the season several thousand people gathered there, though at the time of explosion there were but a few hundred. Though located on an elevation between the city and the crater, it was by great good fortune saved. The governor of Martinique, Mr. Moutet, whose precautions to prevent the people fleeing from the city aided to make the work of death complete, was himself among the victims of the burning mountain. With him in this fate was Colonel Dane, commander of the troops, who... Section 30 of the San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Guero The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire by Charles Morris Chapter 29 St. Vincent Island and Mont Soufriere in 1812 among all the islands of the Caribbees, St. Vincent is unique in natural wonders and beauties. Situated about ninety-five miles west of Barbados, it has a length of eighteen and a width of eleven miles, the whole mass being largely composed of a single peak which rises from the ocean's bed. From north to south, volcanic hills traverse its length, their ridges intersected by fertile and beautiful valleys. A ridge of mountains crosses the island, dividing it into eastern and western parts. Kingstown, the capital, a town of 8,000 inhabitants, is on the southward side and extends along the shores of a beautiful bay, with mountains gradually rising behind it in the form of a vast amphitheater. Three streets, broad and lined with good houses, run parallel to the waterfront. There are many other intersecting highways, some of which lead back to the foothills, from which good roads ascend the mountains. The majority of the houses have red tile roofing, and a goodly number of them are of stone, one story high, with thick walls after the Spanish style, the same types of houses that were in St. Pierre, and which are not unlike the old Roman houses, which in all stages of ruin and semi-preservation are found in Pompeii to this day. Behind the general group of the houses of the town loom the governor's residence and the buildings of the botanical gardens which overlook the town. 
Kingstown is the trading center and the town of importance in the island. It contains the churches and chapels of five Protestant denominations and a number of excellent schools. Away from Kingstown and the smaller settlement of Georgetown, the population is almost wholly rural, occupying scattered villages which consist of negro huts clustering around a few substantial buildings or of cabins grouped about old plantation buildings, somewhat after the antebellum fashion in our own southern states. One of the tragedies of the West Indies was the sinking of Old Port Royal, the resort of buccaneers, in 1692. The harbor of Kingstown is commonly supposed to cover the site of the old settlement. There is a tradition that a buoy for many years was attached to the spire of a sunken church in order to warn mariners. Three thousand persons perished in the disaster. Descendants of Original Indian Population The northern portion of the island, that desolated by the recent volcanic eruption, was inhabited by people living in the manner just described, the great majority of them being Negroes. The total population of the island is about 45,000, of whom 30,000 are Africans and about 3,000 Europeans, the remainder being nearly all Asiatics. There are, or rather were, a number of Caribs, the descendants of the original warlike Indian population of these islands. Many of these live in St. Vincent, though there are others in Dominico. As their residence was in the northern section of the island, the volcano seems to have completed the work for the Caribs of this island, which the Spaniard long ago began. These Caribs were really half-breds, having amalgamated with the Negroes. Many of the blacks own land of their own, raising arrow root, which, since the decay of the sugar industry, is the chief export. In an island only eighteen miles long by eleven broad, there is not room for any distinctly marked mountain range. The whole of St. Vincent, in fact, is a fantastic tumble of hills, culminating in the volcanic ridge which runs lengthwise of the oval-shaped island. The culminating peak of the great volcanic mass, for St. Vincent, is nothing more, is Mont Garou, of which La Soufriere is a sort of lofty excrescence in the northwest, 4,048 feet high, and flanking the main peak at some distance away. It may be said that all the volcanic mountains in this part of the West Indies have what the people call a Soufriere, a sulfur pit, or sulfur crater, the name coming, as in the case of past disturbances of Montpellier, from the strong stench of sulfuretted hydrogen which issues from them when the volcano becomes agitated. In 1812 it was La Soufriere adjacent to Mont Garou, which broke loose on the island of St. Vincent, and it is the same Soufriere which again has devastated the island and has bombarded Kingstown with rocks, lava, and ashes. The old crater of Mont Garou has long been extinct, and like the old crater of Mont Pelet, near St. Pierre, it had, far down in its depths, surrounded by sheer cliffs from five hundred to eight hundred feet high, a lake. Glimpses of the lake of Mont Garou are difficult to get, owing to the thick verdure growing about the dangerous edges of the precipices, but those who have seen it describe it as a beautiful sheet of deep blue water. THE APPEARANCE OF THE SOUFRIERE Previous to the eruption of 1812, the appearance of the Soufriere was most interesting. The crater was half a mile in diameter and five hundred feet in depth. In its center was a conical hill, fringed with shrubs and vines, at whose base were two small lakes, one sulfurous, the other pure and tasteless. This lovely and beautiful spot was rendered more interesting by the singularly melodious notes of a bird, an inhabitant of these upper solitudes, and altogether unknown to the other parts of the island, hence called, or supposed to be, invisible, as it had never been seen. It is of interest to state that Frederick A. Ober, in a visit to the island some twenty years ago, succeeded in obtaining specimens of this previously unknown bird. From the fissures of the cone, a thin white smoke exuded, 
occasionally tinged with a light blue flame. Evergreens, flowers, and aromatic shrubs clothed the steep sides of the crater, which made, as the first indication of the eruption on April 27, 1812, a tremulous noise in the air. A severe concussion of the earth followed, and then a column of thick black smoke burst from the crater. THE ERUPTION OF 1812 The eruption which followed these premonitory symptoms was one of the most terrific which had occurred in the West Indies up to that time. It was the culminating event which seemed to relieve a pressure within the earth's crust, which extended from the Mississippi Valley to Caracas, Venezuela, producing terrible effects in the latter place. Here, thirty-five days before the volcanic explosion, the ground was rent and shaken by a frightful earthquake, which hurled the city in ruins to the ground, and killed ten thousand of its inhabitants in a moment of time. La Soufriere made the first historic display of its hidden powers in 1718, when lava poured from its crater. A far more violent demonstration of its destructive forces was that above mentioned. On this occasion the eruption lasted for three days, ruining a number of the estates in the vicinity and destroying many lives. Myriads of tons of ashes, cinders, pumice, and scoria hurled from the crater fell in every section of the island. Volumes of sand darkened the air, and woods, ridges, and cane fields were covered with light gray ashes, which speedily destroyed all vegetation. The sun for three days seemed to be in a total eclipse. The sea was discolored, and the ground bore a wintry appearance from the white crust of fallen ashes. Carib natives who lived in Mornrond fled from their houses to Kingstown. As the third day drew to a close, flames sprang pyramidically from the crater, accompanied by loud thunder and electric flashes, which rent the column of smoke hanging over the volcano. Eruptive matter pouring from the northwest side plunged over the cliff, carrying down rocks and woods in its course. The island was shaken by an earthquake and bombarded with showers of cinders and stones, which set houses on fire and killed many of the natives. The Terrible Earthquake at Caracas For nearly two years before this explosion, earthquakes had been common and sea and land had been agitated from the valley of the Mississippi to the coasts of Venezuela and the mountains of New Granada, and from the Azores to the West Indies. On March 26, 1812, these culminated in the terrible tragedy spoken of above, of which Humboldt gives us a vivid account. On that day the people of the Venezuelan city of Caracas were assembled in the churches, beneath a still and blazing sky when the earth suddenly heaved and shook, like a great monster waking from slumber, and in a single minute ten thousand people were buried beneath the walls of churches and houses, which tumbled in hideous ruin upon their heads. The same earthquake made itself felt along the whole line of the northern cordilleras, working terrible destruction, and shook the earth as far as Santa Fe de Bogota and Honda, 180 leagues from Caracas. This was a preliminary symptom of the internal disorder of the earth. While the wretched inhabitants of Caracas, who had escaped the earthquake, were dying of fever and starvation, and seeking among villages and farms places of safety from the renewed earthquake shocks, the almost forgotten volcano of St. Vincent was muttering in suppressed wrath. For twelve months it had given warning, by frequent shocks of the earth, that it was making ready to play its part in the great subterranean battle. On the 27th of April, its deep-hidden powers broke their bonds, and the conflict between rock and fire began. The Mountain Stones a Herd Boy The first intimation of the outbreak was rather amusing than alarming. A negro boy was herding cattle on the mountainside. A stone fell near him. Another followed. He fancied that some other boys were pelting him from the cliff above, and began throwing stones upward at his fancied concealed tormentors. But the stones fell thicker, among them some too large to be thrown by any human hand. 
Only then did the little fellow awake to the fact that it was not a boy like himself, but the mighty mountain that was flinging these stones at him. He looked up, and saw that the black column which was rising from the crater's mouth was no longer harmless vapor, but dust, ashes, and stones. Leaving the cattle to their fate, he fled for his life, while the mighty cannon of the titans roared behind him as he ran. For three days and nights this continued. Then, on the thirtieth, a stream of lava poured over the crater's rim and rushed downward, reaching the sea in four hours, and the great eruption was at an end. On the same day, says Humboldt, at a distance of more than two hundred leagues, the inhabitants not only of Caracas, but of Calabozo, situated in the midst of the Lianos, over a space of four thousand square leagues, were terrified by a subterranean noise which resembled frequent discharges of the heaviest cannon. It was accompanied by no shock, and what is very remarkable, was as loud on the coast as at eighty leagues distance inland, and at Caracas, as well as at Calabozo, preparations were made to put the place in defense against an enemy who seemed to be advancing with heavy artillery. It was no enemy that man could deal with. Fortunately, it confined its assault to deep noises and desisted from earthquake shocks. Similar noises were heard in Martinique and Guadeloupe, and here also without shocks. The internal thunder was the signal of what was taking place on St. Vincent. With this last warning sound, the trouble, which had lasted so long, was at an end. The earthquakes which for two years had shaken a sheet of the earth's surface, larger than half Europe, were stilled by the eruption of St. Vincent's volcanic peak. Barbados Covered with Ashes Northeast of the original crater of the Soufriere, a new one was formed, which was a half mile in diameter and five hundred feet deep. The old crater was in time transformed into a beautiful blue lake, as above stated, walled in by ragged cliffs to a height of eight hundred feet. It was looked upon as a remarkable circumstance that although the air was perfectly calm during the eruption, Barbados, which is ninety-five miles to the windward, was covered inches deep with ashes. The inhabitants there, and on other neighboring islands, were terrified by the darkness, which continued for four hours and a half. Troops were called under arms, the supposition from the continued noise being that hostile fleets were in an engagement. The movement of the ashes to windward, as just stated, was viewed as a remarkable phenomenon, and decided by Elise Recluse in the ocean to show the force of different aerial currents. On the first day of May, 1812, when the northeast trade wind was in all its force, enormous quantities of ashes obscured the atmosphere above the island of Barbados, and covered the ground with a thick layer. One would have supposed that they came from the volcanoes of the Azores, which were to the northeast. Nevertheless, they were cast up by the crater in St. Vincent, one hundred miles to the west. It is therefore certain that the debris had been hurled, by the force of the eruption, above the moving sheet of the trade winds into an aerial river proceeding in a contrary direction. For this it must have been hurled miles high into the air, till caught by the current of the anti-trade winds. Kingsley's Visit to St. Vincent From Charles Kingsley's At Last we extract from the account of the visit of the author to St. Vincent some interesting matter concerning the 1812 eruption and its effect on the mountain, also its influence upon distant Barbados, as just stated. The strangest fact about this eruption was that the mountain did not make use of its old crater. The original vent must have become so jammed and consolidated in the few years between 1785 and 1812 that it could not be reopened, even by a steam force, the vastness of which may be guessed at from the vastness of the area which it had shaken for two years. So, when the eruption was over, it was found that the old crater lake, incredible as it may seem, remained undisturbed so far as has been ascertained. 
but close to it and separated only by a knife edge of rock some seven hundred feet in height and so narrow that as i was assured by one who had seen it it is dangerous to crawl along it a second crater nearly as large as the first had been blasted out the bottom of which in like manner was afterward filled with water i regretted much that i could not visit it three points i longed to ascertain carefully the relative heights of the water in the two craters the height and nature of the spot where the lava stream issued and lastly if possible the actual causes of the locally famous rabaca or dry river one of the largest streams in the island which was swallowed up during the eruption at a short distance from its source leaving its bed an arid gully to this day but it could not be and i owe what little i know of the summit of the soufriere principally to a most intelligent and gentlemanlike young wesleyan minister whose name has escaped me he described vividly as we stood together on the deck looking up at the volcano the awful beauty of the twin lakes and of the clouds which for months together whirl in and out of the cups in fantastic shapes before the eddies of the trade wind black sunday at barbados the day after the explosion black sunday gave a proof of though no measure of the enormous force which had been exerted eighty miles to windward lies barbados all saturday a heavy cannonading had been heard to the eastward the english and french fleets were surely engaged the soldiers were called out the batteries manned but the cannonade died away and all went to bed in wonder on the first of may the clocks struck six but the sun did not as usual in the tropics answer to the call the darkness was still intense and grew more intense as the morning wore on a slow and silent rain of impalpable dust was falling over the whole island the negroes rushed shrieking into the streets surely the last day was come the white folk caught and little blame to them the panic and some began to pray who had not prayed for years the pious and the educated and there were plenty of both in barbados were not proof against the infection old letters described the scene in the churches that morning as hideous prayers sobs and cries in stygian darkness from trembling crowds and still the darkness continued and the dust fell incidents at barbados I have a letter written by one long since dead, who had at least powers of description of no common order, telling how, when he tried to go out of his house upon the east coast, he could not find the trees on his own lawn save by feeling for their stems. He stood amazed not only in utter darkness, but in utter silence, for the trade wind had fallen dead. The everlasting roar of the surf was gone and the only noise was the crashing of branches snapped by the weight of the clammy dust he went in again and waited about one o'clock the veil began to lift a lurid sunlight stared in from the horizon but all was black overhead gradually the dust drifted away the island saw the sun once more and saw itself inches deep in black and in this case fertilizing dust the trade wind blew suddenly once more out of the clear east and the surf roared again along the shore meanwhile a heavy earthquake wave had struck part at least of the shores of barbados the gentlemen on the east coast going out found traces of the sea and boats and logs washed up some ten to twenty feet above high tide mark a convulsion which seemed to have gone unmarked during the general dismay one man at least an old friend of john hunter sir joseph banks and others their compeers was above the dismay and the superstitious panic which accompanied it finding it still dark when he rose to dress he opened so the story used to run his window found its stick and felt upon the sill a coat of soft powder the volcano in st vincent has broken out at last said the wise man and this is the dust of it so he quieted his household and his negroes lighted his candles and went to his scientific books in that delight mingled with an awe not the less deep 
because it is rational and self-possessed, with which he Section 31 of The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in June 2010 The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire by Charles Morris Chapter 30 Submarine Volcanoes and Their Work of Island Building In November 1867, a volcano suddenly began to show signs of activity beneath the deep sea of the Pacific Ocean. There are some islands nearly 2,000 miles to the east of Australia, called the Navigators Group, in which there had been no history of an eruption, nor had such an event been handed down by tradition. Most of the islands in the Pacific Ocean are old volcanoes, or are made up of rocks cast forth from extinct burning mountains. They rise up like peaks through the great depths of the ocean, and the top, which just appears above the sea level, is generally encircled by a growth of coral. Hence, they are termed coral islands. These islands every now and then rise higher than the sea level, owing to some deep upheaving force, and then the coral is lifted up above the water and become a solid rock. But occasionally the reverse of this takes place, and the islands begin to sink into the sea, owing to a force which causes the base of the submarine mountain to become depressed. Sometimes they disappear. All this shows that some great disturbing forces are in action at the bottom of the sea and just within the earth's crust, and that they are of a volcanic nature. For some time before the eruption in question, earthquakes shook the surrounding islands of the navigators group and caused great alarm, and when the trembling of the earth was very great, the sea began to be agitated near one of the islands, and vast circles of disturbed water were formed. Soon the water began to be forced upwards, and dead fish were seen floating about. After a while, steam rushed forth, and jets of mud and volcanic sand. Moreover, when the steam began to rush up out of the water, the violence of the general agitation of the land and of the surface of the sea increased. An Eruption Described When the eruption was at its height, Vast columns of mud and masses of stone rushed into the air to a height of 2,000 feet, and the fearful crash of masses of rock hurled upwards and coming in collision with others which were falling attested the great volume of ejected matter which accumulated in the bed of the ocean, although no trace of a volcano could be seen above the surface of the sea. Similar submarine volcanic action has been observed in the Atlantic Ocean, and crews of ships have reported that they have seen in different places sulfurous smoke, flame, jets of water, and steam rising up from the sea, or they have observed the waters greatly discolored and in a state of violent agitation, as if boiling in large circles. New shoals have also been encountered, or a reef of rocks just emerging above the surface, where previously there was always supposed to have been deep water. On some few occasions the gradual building up of an island by submarine volcanoes has been observed, as that of Sabrina in 1181 of St. Michael's in the Azores. The throwing up of ashes in this case, and the formation of a conical hill 300 feet high with a crater out of which spouted lava and steam took place very rapidly. But the waves had the best of it, and finally washed Sabrina into the depths of the ocean. Previous eruptions in the same part of the sea were recorded as having happened in 1691 and 1720. In 1831, a submarine volcanic eruption occurred in the Mediterranean Sea, 
between Sicily and that part of the African coast where Carthage formerly stood. A few years before, Captain Smythe had sounded the spot in a survey of the sea ordered by government, and he found the sea bottom to be under 500 feet of water. On June 28, about a fortnight before the eruption was visible, Sir Pulteney Malcolm, in passing over the spot in his ship, felt the shock of an earthquake, as if he had struck on a sandbank, and the same shocks were felt on the west coast of Sicily, in a direction from southwest to northeast. Building up of an island by submarine volcanoes about July 10, the captain of a Sicilian vessel reported that as he passed near the place, he saw a column of water like a water spout, 60 feet high and 800 yards in circumference, rising from the sea, and soon after a dense rush of steam in its place, which ascended to the height of 1,800 feet. The same captain, on his return 18 days after, found a small island twelve feet high, with a crater in its center, throwing forth volcanic matter and immense columns of vapor, the sea around being covered with floating cinders and dead fish. The eruption continued with great violence to the end of the same month. By the end of the month, the island grew to ninety feet in height and measured three-quarters of a mile round. By August 4th, it became 200 feet high and 3 miles in circumference, after which it began to diminish in size by the action of the waves. Towards the end of October, the island was leveled nearly to the surface of the sea. Naval officers and foreign ministers alike took an absorbing interest in this new island. The strong national thirst for territory manifested itself and eager mariners waited only till the new land should be cool enough to set foot on, to strive who should be first to plant there his country's flag. Names in abundance were given it by successive observers, Nerita, Scatia, Fernandina, Julia, Hotham, Corao, and Graham. The last holds good in English speech, and as Graham's island it is known in books today, though the sea took back what it had given, leaving but a shoal of cinders and sand. The Bay of Santorin, in the island of that name, which lies immediately to the north of Crete, has long been noted for its submarine volcanoes. According to one account, indeed, the whole island was at a remote period raised from the bottom of the sea, but this is questionable. It is, with more reason, supposed that the bay is the site of an ancient crater, which was situated on the summit of a volcanic cone that subsequently fell in. Certain it is that islands have from time to time been thrown up by volcanic forces from the bottom of the sea within this bay, and that some of them have remained, while others have sunk again. How an island grew Of the existing islands, some were thrown up shortly before the beginning of the Christian era, in particular, one called the Great Kameni, which, however, received a considerable accession to its size by a fresh eruption in Anno Domini 726. The islet nearest Santorin was raised in 1573 and was named the Little Kameni, and in 1707 there was added, between the other two, a third, which is now called the Black Island. This made its appearance above water on the 23rd of May, 1707, and was first mistaken for a wreck, but some sailors who landed on it found it to be a mass of rock, consisting of a very white, soft stone, to which were adhering quantities of fresh oysters. While they were collecting these, a violent shaking of the ground scared them away. During several weeks, the island gradually increased in volume, but in July, at a distance of about 60 paces from the new islet, there was thrown up a chain of black calcined rocks, followed by volumes of thick black smoke, having a sulphurous smell. A few days thereafter, the water all around the spot became hot, and many dead fishes were thrown up. Then, with loud subterraneous noises, 
flames arose, and fresh quantities of stones and other substances were ejected, until the chain of black rocks became united to the first islet that had appeared. This eruption continued for a long time, there being thrown out quantities of ashes and pumice, which covered the island of Santorin and the surface of the sea, some being drifted to the coasts of Asia Minor and the Dardanelles. The activity of this miniature volcano was prolonged, with greater or less energy, for about ten years. In 1866, similar phenomena took place in the Bay of Santorin, beginning with underground sounds and slight shocks of earthquake, which were followed by the appearance of flames on the surface of the sea. Soon after, there arose, out of a dense smoke, a small islet, which gradually increased until in a week's time it was sixty feet high, two hundred long, and ninety wide. The people of Santorin named it George, in honor of the king of Greece. In another week it joined and became continuous with the little Kameni. The detonations increased in loudness, and large quantities of incandescent stones were thrown up from the crater. About the same time, at the distance of nearly 150 feet from the coast, to the westward of a point called Cape Flego, there rose from the sea another island, to which was given the name of Afroessa. It sank and reappeared several times before it established itself above water. The detonations and ejection of incandescent lava and stones continued at intervals during three weeks. From the crater of the island George, which attained a height of 150 feet, some stones, several cubic yards in bulk, were projected to a great distance. One of them, falling on board of a merchant vessel, killed the captain and set fire to the ship. By the 10th of March the eruptions had partially subsided, but were then renewed, and the third island, which was named Reka, rose alongside of Afroessa. They were at first separated by a channel sixty feet deep, but in three days this was filled up and the two islets became united. Reference may properly be made here to Monte Nuevo and Yorullo, not that they appertain to the present subject, but that they form examples of the action of similar forces, in the one instance exerted on a lake bottom, in the other on dry land, each yielding permanent volcanic elevations in every respect analogous to those which rise as islands from the bottom of the sea. In the Icelandic Seas Off the coast of Iceland, islands have appeared during several of the volcanic eruptions which that remote dependency of Denmark has manifested, and at various periods in Iceland's history, the sea has been covered with pumice and other debris, which tell their own tale of what has been going on, without being in sufficient quantity to reach the surface in the form of an island mass. The sea of Reykjanes, Smoky Cape, as the name means, has been a frequent scene of these submarine eruptions. In 1240, during what the Icelandic historians describe as the Eighth Outburst, a number of islets were formed, though most of them subsequently disappeared, only to have their places occupied by others born at a later date. In 1422, high rocks of considerable circumference appeared. In 1783, about a month before the eruption of Skapta Jokul, a volcanic island named Nyö, from which fire and smoke issued, was built up but in time it vanished under the waves, all that remains of it today being a reef from five to thirty-five fathoms below the sea level. In 1830, after several long-continued eruptions of the usual character, another isle arose, while at the same time the skerries known as the Gaia Fuglaska disappeared, and with them vanished the great auks or gearfowls, birds now extinct, which up to that time had bred on them. At all events, though the auks could not well have been drowned, no traces of them were seen after the date mentioned. 
In July 1884, an island again appeared about 10 miles off Reykjanes, but it is already beginning to diminish in size and may soon disappear. Off the coast of Alaska Elsewhere in the region of the northern seas, there are other instances of the influence of the submarine forces in raising up and lowering land. The coast of Alaska is a region of intense volcanic action. In 1795, during a period of volcanic activity in the craters of Makushina, on Unalaska, and in others on Umnak Island, a volume of smoke was seen to rise out of the sea about 42 miles to the north of Unalaska, and the next year it was followed by a heap of cindery material from which arose flame and volcanic matter, the glow being visible over a radius of 10 miles. In four years the island grew into a large cone, 3,000 feet above the sea level, and two or three miles in circumference. Two years later, it was still so hot that when some hunters landed on it, they found the soil too warm for walking. It was named Yonna Bogoslova, St. John the Theologian, by the Russians, Agashagok by the Aleuts, and is now known to the whites of that region as Bogoslov. Mr. Dahl believes that it occupies the site of some rocks that existed there as long as tradition extends. There were additions to the cone up to the year 1823, when it became so quiescent as to be the favorite haunt of seals and sea-fowls, and, when the weather was favorable, was visited by native egg-hunters from Unalaska. During the summer of 1883, Borosloff was again seen in eruption, as it was thought. However, on closely examining the neighborhood, it was found that the old island was undisturbed, but that there had been a fresh eruption, which had resulted in the extension of Bogoslov by the appearance of a cone and crater, Hague Volcano, 357 feet high, connected with the parent island by a low sand spit, and situated in a spot where, the year before, the lead showed 800 fathoms of water. At the same time, Augustin and two other previously quiet islands on the peninsula of Alaska began simultaneously to emit smoke, dust, and ashes, while a reef running westward and formerly submerged became elevated to the sea surface. Other islands, of a region exactly similar to Bogoslov and those mentioned, are to be found in this region, notably Konyugi and Kasatochi in the western Aleutians, and Pinnacle Island, near St. Matthew Island. Indeed, the volcano of Kliuchevsk, which rises to a height of over 15,000 feet, is really a volcanic island. A permanent addition was made to the Aleutian group of islands by the action of a submarine volcano in 1806. This new island has the form of a volcanic peak, with several subsidiary cones. It is four geographical miles in circumference. In 1814, another arose out of the sea in the same archipelago, the cone of which attained a height of 3,000 feet, but at the end of a year it lost a portion of this elevation. In 1856, in the sea in the same neighborhood, Captain Newell of the whaling bark Alice Fraser witnessed the submarine eruption, which was also seen by the crews of several other vessels. There was no island formed on this occasion, but large jets of water were thrown up, and the sea was greatly agitated all around. Then followed volcanic smoke and quantities of stones, ashes, and pumice, the two latter being scattered over the surface of the sea to a great distance. Loud thundering reports accompanied this eruption, and all the ships in the neighborhood felt concussions like those produced by an earthquake. These phenomena seem to have ended in the formation of some great submarine chasm into which the waters rushed with extreme violence and a terrific roar. Occurrences similar to this last have been several times observed in a tract of open sea in the Atlantic, 
about half a degree south of the equator, and between 20 and 22 degrees of west longitude. Although quantities of volcanic dross have been from time to time thrown up to the surface in this region, no island has yet made its appearance above water. The events here described repeat on a far smaller scale similar ones which have occurred in remote ages in many parts of the ocean and left great island masses as the permanent effects of their work. We may instance the Hawaiian group, which is wholly of volcanic origin, with the exception of its minor coral additions, and represent a stupendous activity of underground agencies beneath the domain of Father Neptune. In part, as we have said elsewhere in this work, all oceanic islands, remote from those in the shoal bordering waters of the continents, have been of volcanic or coral formation, or more often a combination of the two. No sooner does an island mass appear above or near the surface of tropical waters than the minute coral animals, effective only by their myriads, begin their labors, building fringes of coral rock around the cindery heaps lifted from the ocean floor. The atolls of the Pacific, circular or oval rings of coral with lagoons of seawater within, have long been thought to be built on the rims of submarine volcanoes, rising to within a few hundred feet of the surface, much as coral reefs around actual islands. If the volcanic mass should subsequently subside, as it is likely to do, the minute ocean builders will continue their work, until the subsidence be too rapid for their powers of production, and in this way ring-like islands of coral may in time rise from great depths of sea, their basis being the volcanic islands. Section 32 of The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dennis Sayers. The San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire. By Charles Morris. Chapter 31 Mud Volcanoes, Geysers, and Hot Springs. Our usual impression of a volcano is indicated in the title of Burning Mountain, so often employed, a great fire spouting cone of volcanic debris, from which steam, lava, rock masses, cinder like fragments, and dust often of extreme fineness, are flung high into the air, or flow in river-like torrents of molten rock. This, no doubt, applies in the majority of cases, but the volcanic forces do not confine themselves to these magnificent displays of energy, nor are their products limited to those above specified. We have seen that mud is a not uncommon product, due to the mingling of water with volcanic dust, while water alone is occasionally emitted, of which we have a marked instance in the Volcan de Agua of Guatemala, already mentioned. As regards mud flows, we may specially instance the first outflow from Mount Pele, that by which the Garan sugar works were overwhelmed. The imprisoned forces of the earth have still other modes of manifestation. A very frequent one of these, and the most destructive to human life of them all, is the earthquake. Minor manifestations of volcanic action may be seen in the geyser and the hot spring, the latter the most widely disseminated of all the resultant effects of the heated condition of the earth's interior. It is these displays of subterranean energy, differing from those usually termed volcanic, 
yet due to the same general causes that we have next to consider. And it may be premised that their manifestations, while, except in the case of the earthquake, less violent, are no less interesting, especially as the minor displays are free from that peril to human life which renders the major ones so terrible. While the largest volcanoes at times pour out rivers of liquid mud, there are volcanoes from which nothing is ever ejected but mud and water, the latter being generally salt. From this circumstance, they are sometimes called salses, but they are more generally termed mud volcanoes. Some varieties of them throw out little else than gases of different sorts, and these are called air volcanoes. THE GREAT MUD VOLCANO OF SICILY One of the best-known mud volcanoes is at Maculuba, near Girgenti in Sicily. It consists of several conical mounds, varying from time to time in their form and height, which ranges from eight to thirty feet. From orifices on the tops of these mounds, there are thrown out sometimes jets of warmish water and mud mixed with bitumen, sometimes bubbles of gas, chiefly carbonic acid and carburetted hydrogen, occasionally pure nitrogen. The mud ejected has often a strong sulfurous smell. The jets, in general, ascend only to a moderate height, but occasionally they are thrown up with great violence, attaining a height of about 200 feet. In 1777 there was ejected an immense column, consisting of mud strongly impregnated with sulphur and mixed with naphtha and stones, accompanied also by quantities of sulphurous vapors. This mud volcano is known to have been in action for fifteen centuries. Very recently a small mud volcano has been formed on the flanks of Mount Etna. It began with the throwing up of jets of boiling water, mixed with petroleum and mud, great quantities of gas bubbling up at the same time. In several of the valleys of Iceland there are similar phenomena, the boiling water and mud being thrown up in jets to the height of fifteen feet and upwards, the mud accumulating around the orifices whence the jets arise. A mud volcano named Korobetov in the Crimea presents phenomena more akin to those of the igneous volcanoes of South America. There was an eruption from this mountain on the 6th of August, 1853. It began by throwing up from the summit a column of fire and smoke, which ascended to a great height. This continued for five or six minutes, and was followed at short intervals by two similar eruptions. There was then ejected, with a hissing noise, a quantity of black fetid mud, which was so hot as to scorch the grass on the edges of the stream. The mud continued to pour out for three hours, covering a wide space at the mountain's base. The mud volcanoes on the coast of Baluchistan are very numerous, and extend over an area of nearly a thousand miles. Their action resembles that at Makaluba. THE MUD VOLCANO OF JAVA there is a mud volcano in Java which is of interest as somewhat resembling the geyser in its mode of operation, and apparently due to similar agencies. It is thus described by Dr. Horsfield. Quote, On approaching it from a distance, it is first discovered by a large volume of smoke, rising and disappearing at intervals of a few seconds, resembling the vapors rising from a violent surf. A loud noise is heard, like that of distant thunder. Having advanced so near that the vision was no longer impeded by the smoke, a large hemispherical mass was observed, 
consisting of black earth mixed with water, about sixteen feet in diameter, rising to the height of twenty or thirty feet in a perfectly regular manner, and as if it were pushed up by a great force beneath, which suddenly exploded with a loud noise, and scattered about a volume of black mud in every direction. After an interval of two or three or sometimes four or five seconds, the hemispherical body of mud rose and exploded again. In the manner stated, this volcanic ebullition goes on without interruption, throwing up a globular body of mud, and dispersing it with violence through the neighboring plain. The spot where the ebullition occurs is nearly circular, and perfectly level. It is covered only with the earthy particles, impregnated with salt water, which are thrown up from below. The circumference may be estimated at about half an English mile. In order to conduct the salt water to the circumference, small passages or gutters are made in the loose muddy earth, which lead to the borders, where it is collected in holes dug in the ground, for the purpose of evaporation. Close quote. The mud has a strong, pungent, sulfurous smell, resembling that of mineral oil, and is hotter than the surrounding atmosphere. During the rainy season, the explosions increase in violence. There are submarine mud volcanoes, as well as those of igneous kind. In 1814, one of this character broke out in the Sea of Azov, beginning with flame and black smoke, accompanied by earth and stones, which were flung to a great height. Ten of these explosions occurred, and, after a period of rest, others were heard during the night. The next morning there was visible, above the water, an island of mud some ten feet high. A very similar occurrence took place in 1827, near Baku, in the Caspian Sea. This began with a flaming display and the ejection of great fragments of rock. An eruption of mud succeeded. A set of small volcanoes discovered by Humboldt and Turbaco in South America confined their emissions almost wholly to gases, chiefly nitrogen. There is a close connection in character between mud volcanoes and those intermittent boiling springs, named geysers. A good many of the mud volcanoes throw out jets of boiling water along with the mud, but in the case of the geysers, the boiling water is ejected alone, without any visible impregnation, though some mineral in solution, as silica, carbonate of lime, or sulfur, is usually present. The geyser is a water volcano. The phenomenon of the geyser serves in a measure to support the theory that steam is an important agent in volcanic action. A geyser, in fact, may be designated as a water volcano, since it throws up water only. It comprises a cone, or mound, usually only a few feet high. In the middle of this is a crater-like opening, with a passage leading down into the earth. As in the case of the volcano, the geyser cone is built up by its own action. In the boiling water, which is ejected, there is dissolved a certain amount of silica. As the water falls and cools, this mineral is deposited, usually building up a cup-like elevation. The basin of the geyser is generally full of clear water, with a little steam rising from its surface. But at intervals, an eruption takes place, sometimes at regular periods, but more often at irregular intervals. Perhaps the largest and best known geysers in the world are those of Iceland, chief among them being the Great Geyser. Silica is the mineral with which the waters of this fountain are impregnated, and the substance which they deposit, as they slowly evaporate, is named 
Silatius Center. Of this material is comprised the mound, six or seven feet high, on which the spring is situated. On the top of the mound is a large oval basin, about three feet in depth, measuring in its larger diameter about fifty-six, and in its shorter about forty-six feet. The center of this basin is occupied by a circular well, about ten feet in diameter, and between seventy and eighty feet deep. Out of the central well springs a jet of boiling water, at intervals of six or seven hours. When the fountain is at rest, both the basin and the well appear quite empty, and no steam is seen. But on the approach of the moment for action, the water rises in the well, till it flows over into the basin. Then loud subterranean explosions are heard, and the ground all round is violently shaken. Instantly, and with immense force, a steaming jet of boiling water, of the full width of the well, springs up and ascends to a great height in the air. The top of this large column of water is enveloped in vast clouds of steam, which diffuse themselves through the air, rendering it misty. These jets succeed each other with great rapidity to the number of sixteen or eighteen, the period of action of the fountain being about five minutes. The last of the jets generally ascends to the greatest height, usually to about a hundred, but sometimes to one hundred and fifty feet. On one occasion it rose to the great height of two hundred and twelve feet. Having ejected this great column of water, the action ceases, and the water that had filled the basin sinks down into the well. There it remains till the time for the next eruption, when the same phenomena are repeated. It has been found that by throwing large stones into the well, the period of the eruption may be hastened, while the loudness of the explosions and the violence of the fountain effect are increased, the stones being, at the same time, ejected with great force. Eruption can be induced by artificial means. Geysers are found all over the island, presenting various peculiarities. In the case of one of the smaller ones, which is called Stroker, or the Churn, an eruption can be induced by artificial means. A barrel load of sods is thrown into the crater of the geyser, with the effect of causing an eruption. The sensitiveness of Stroker is due to its peculiar form. An observer states that, quote, the bore is eight feet in diameter at the top, and forty-four feet deep. Below twenty-seven feet it contracts to nineteen inches, so that the turf thrown in completely chokes it. Steam collects below. A foaming scum covers the surface of the water, and in a quarter of an hour it surges up the pipe. The fountain then begins playing, sending its bundles of jets rather higher than those of the great geyser, flinging up the clods of turf which had been its obstruction like a number of rockets. This magnificent display continues for a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes. The erupted water flows back into the pipe from the curved sides of the bowl. This occasions a succession of bursts, the last expiring effort, very generally, being the most magnificent. Stroker gives no warning thumps, like the great geyser, and there is not the same roaring of steam, accompanying the outbreak of the water. Close quote. The same author thus describes an eruption of the great geyser, which occurred about two o'clock in the morning. Quote, a violent concussion of the ground brought me and my companions to our feet. We rushed out of the tent in every condition of deshabille, 
and were in time to see Geyser put forth his full strength. Five strokes underground were the signal, then an overflow, wetting every side of the mound. Presently a dome of water rose in the center of the basin, and fell again, immediately to be followed by a fresh bell, which sprang into the air fully forty feet high, accompanied by a roaring burst of steam. Instantly the fountain began to play with the utmost violence, a column rushing up to the height of ninety or one hundred feet against the grey night sky, with mighty volumes of white steam cloud rolling after it, and swept off by the breeze to fall in torrents of hot rain. Jets and lines of water tore their way through the clouds, or leaped high above its domed mass. The earth trembled and throbbed during the explosion. Then the column sank, started up again, dropped once more, and seemed to be sucked back into the earth. We ran to the basin, which was left dry, and looked down the bore at the water, which was bubbling at the depth of six feet. Close quote. In the case of Stroker, the cause of this eruption is not difficult to understand. The narrow part of the channel is choked up by the turf and the steam, and prevented from escaping. Finally, it gains such force as to drive out the obstacle with a violent explosion, just as a bottle of fermenting liquor may blow out the cork and discharge some of its contents. Geysers are somewhat abundant phenomena existing in many parts of the earth, while striking examples of them are found in the widely separated regions of Iceland, New Zealand, Japan, and the western United States. In the volcanic region of New Zealand, geysers and their associated hot springs are abundant. It was to their action that we owed the famous white and pink terraces and the warm lake of Rotamahana, which were ruined by the destructive eruption of Mount Tarawera, already described. Geysers of the United States The United States is abundantly supplied with hot springs, but geysers outside of the Yellowstone region are found only in California and Nevada. Those of California exist chiefly in Napa Valley, north of San Francisco, in a canyon, or defile. Their waters are impregnated not with silica, but with sulfur, and they thus approach more nearly in their character to mud volcanoes, whose ejections are, in like manner, much impregnated with that substance. They are also, like them, collected in groups, there being no less than one hundred openings within a space of flat ground a mile square. Owing to their number and proximity, their individual energy is nothing like so violent as that of the geysers of Iceland. Their jets seldom rise higher than twenty or thirty feet, but so great a number playing within so confined a space produces an imposing effect. The jets of boiling water issue with a loud noise from little conical mounds, around which the ground is merely a crust of sulphur. When this crust is penetrated, the boiling water may be seen underneath. The rocks in the neighborhood of these fountains are all corroded by the action of the sulphurous vapors. Nevertheless, within a distance of not more than fifty feet from them, trees grow without injury to their health. Few of these fountains, however, are regular geysers, most of them discharging only steam. From the steamboat geyser, this ascends to a height of from fifty to one hundred feet, with a roar like that of the escape from a steamboat boiler. Associated with the geysers are numerous hot springs, some clear, some turbid, and variously impregnated with iron, 
sulphur, or alum. In Nevada, the steamboat springs, as they are designated, exist in Washoe Valley, east of the Virginian Range. They come nearer in character to the Yellowstone geysers, their waters depositing true geyserite, or siliceous concretions. The Volcano Springs in Louder County are also true geysers, though of small importance. The ground here is so thickly perforated by holes from which steam escapes that it looks like a colander. THE YELLOWSTONE GEYSERS The most remarkable geyser country in the world, alike for the size and the number of its spouting fountains, is the Yellowstone region in the northwest part of the territory of Wyoming in the United States, which, by a special act of Congress, has been reserved as the Yellowstone National Park, exempt from settlement, purchase, or preemption. Here nearly every form of geyser and unintermittent hot spring occurs, with deposits of various kinds, siliceous, calcareous, etc. Of the hot springs, Dr. Peel enumerates 2,195, and considers that within the limits of the park, which is about 54 miles by 62 miles, and includes 3,312 square miles, as many as 3,000 exist. The same geologist notes the existence of 71 geysers in the area mentioned, though some of the number are only inferred to be spouting springs from the form of their basins and the character of the surrounding deposits. Of this vast collection of still and eruptive springs, between which there seems every gradation, those which do not send water into the air are, owing to the magnificent cascades which they form, often quite as remarkable as those which take the shape of geysers. The more striking of the latter may, however, be briefly mentioned. In the Gibbon Basin is a geyser of late origin. In 1878 this consisted of two steam holes, roaring on the side of a hill that looked as if they had recently burst through the surface, and the gully, leading towards the ravine, was at that date filled with sand, which appeared to have been poured out during an eruption. Dead trees stood on the line of this sand floor, and others, with their bark still remaining, and even with their foliage not lost, were uprooted hard by, everything indicating that the steamboat vent, as it was called, was of recent formation. In 1875 it had no existence, but in 1879 the spouting spring, which first opened, it is believed, on the 11th of August in the preceding year, had, quote, settled down to business as a very powerful flowing geyser, close quote, with a double period, one eruption occurring every half hour, and projecting water to the height of thirty feet, the main eruption occurring every six or seven days, with long, continued action, and a column of nearly one hundred feet. The new geyser in the same basin is also of quite recent origin. It consists of two fissures in the rock, in which the water boils vigorously, but there is no mound, and the rocks of the fissure are just beginning to get a coating of the siliceous geyserite deposited from the water, so that it cannot long have been spouting. Again, in the Grotto geyser, in the upper geyser basin of Firehole River, the main or larger crater is hollowed into fantastic arches, beneath which are the grotto-like cavities from which it is named, which act as lateral orifices for the escape of water during an eruption. It plays several times in the course of the twenty-four hours, and sends a column of water sixty feet high, the eruption lasting an hour. As yet, however, 
the force of the water has not been sufficient or of sufficiently long duration to break through the arches covering the basin or crater the excelsior claimed to be the largest of its order which sent water nearly three hundred feet into the air at intervals of about five hours and of such volume as to wash away bridges over small streams below was not until comparatively recent years known as a specially powerful geyser but if it had for a time waned in importance its immense crater three hundred and thirty feet in length and two hundred feet at the widest part shows that at a still earlier date it was a gigantic fountain. In this deep pit, when the breeze wafted aside the clouds of steam constantly arising from its surface, the water could be seen seething fifteen or twenty feet below the surrounding level. Yet into the cauldron of boiling water, a little stream of cold water from the melting snow of the uplands ran unceasingly. Since 1888, this great geyser has been inactive. The Castle Geyser is so named on account of the fancied resemblance which its mound of white and grey deposit presents to the ruins of a feudal keep, the crater itself being placed on a cone or turret, which has a somewhat imposing appearance compared with the other geysers in the neighborhood. It throws a column usually about fifty or sixty feet high, at intervals of two or three hours, but sometimes the discharge shoots up much higher. The giant, in the upper geyser basin, has a peculiar crater, which has been likened to the stump of a hollow sycamore tree of gigantic proportions, whose top has been wrenched off by a storm. The curious cup is broken down at one side, as though it had been torn away during an eruption of more than ordinary violence, and on this side the visitor is able to look into the crater, if he can contrive to avoid the jets which are constantly spouted from it. The periods of rest which it takes are varied, an eruption often not occurring for several days at a time, yet when it breaks out it continues playing for more than three hours, with a volume of water reaching a height of from a hundred and thirty to a hundred and forty feet. In the interval little spouts are constantly in progress. Mr. Stanley saw one eruption which he calculated to have shot a column of water to the height of more than two hundred feet. At first it seemed as though the geyser was only making a feint, the discharge which preceded the great one being merely repeated several times, followed by a cessation both of the rumbling noises and of the ejection of water. But soon after a premonitory cloud of steam, the geyser began to work in earnest, the column discharged rising higher and higher until it reached the altitude mentioned. Quote, At first it appeared to labor in raising the immense volume, which seemed loath to start on its heavenward tour, but it was with perfect ease that the stupendous column was held to its place, the water breaking into jets and returning in glittering showers to the basin. The steam ascended in dense volumes for thousands of feet, when it was freighted on the wings of the winds and borne away in clouds. The fearful rumble and confusion attending it were as the sound of distant artillery, the rushing of many horses to battle, or the roar of a fearful tornado. It commenced to act at 2 p.m., and continued for an hour and a half, the latter part of which it emitted little else than steam, rushing upward from its chambers below, of which, if controlled, there was enough to run an engine of wonderful power. The 
waving to and fro of such a gigantic fountain when the column is at its height tinseled o'er in robes of varying hues and glistening in the bright sunlight which adorns it with the glowing colors of many a gorgeous rainbow affords a spectacle so wonderful and grandly magnificent so overwhelming to the mind that the ablest attempt at description gives the reader who has never witnessed such a display but a feeble idea of its glory Close quote. a description of the geyser at work the only other geysers in this remarkable geyser land which we can spare room to notice are those of the giantess the beehive and the grand the giantess sends a column of water to the height of two hundred and fifty feet an eruption is usually divided into three periods two preliminary efforts and a final one divided from each other by intervals of between one and two hours while the intervals of discharge are very long sometimes it does not play for several weeks the beehive which is four hundred feet from the giantess gets its name from the peculiar beehive-like cone which it has formed the eruption is also almost unique it is heralded by a slight escape of steam which is followed by a column of steam and water shooting to the height of over two hundred feet the column is somewhat fan-shaped but it does not fall in rain the spray being evaporated and carried off as steam if indeed there is not more steam than water in the column the duration of the discharge is between four and five minutes and the interval between two eruptions from twenty-one to twenty-five hours the grand is one of the most important in the upper geyser basin yet unlike the grotto the giant or the old faithful so called from its frequent and regular eruptions it has no raised cone or crater and a much less cavernous bowl than the giantess and other geysers the column discharged ascends to the height of from eighty to two hundred feet and the eruptions last from fifteen minutes to three quarters of an hour with intervals on an average of from seven to twenty hours this fountain is apparently very irregular in its action though it is just possible that when the yellowstone geysers have been more consecutively studied it will be found that these seeming irregularities depend on the varying supplies of water at different times of the year the mammoth hot springs the marvelous phenomena of the yellowstone region are not confined to geyser action hot springs of steady flow being as above stated exceedingly numerous of these the most striking are those known as the mammoth hot springs whose waters find their way through underground passages finally flowing from an opening as the boiling river which empties into the gardener river these springs are marvels of beauty their terraced bowls adorned with delicate fretwork are among the finest specimens of nature's handiwork in the world and the colored waters themselves are startling in their brilliancy red pink black canary green saffron blue chocolate and all their intermediate gradations are found here in exquisite harmony the springs rise in terraces of various heights and widths having intermingled with their delicate shades chalk like cliffs soft and crumbly these latter being the remains of springs from which the life and beauty have departed the great spring is the largest in the country the water flowing through three openings into a basin forty feet long by twenty-five feet wide 
From this the hot mineral waters drip over into lower basins of gracefully curved and scalloped outline, the minerals deposited on the lips of the basin forming stalagmites of variegated hue, yielding a brilliant and beautiful effect. The terraced basins bear a close resemblance to the former New Zealand pink and white terraces, and since the annihilation of the latter, are the most charming examples in existence of this rare form of nature's artistic handiwork. End of chapter 31 And end of the San Francisco Calamity by Earthquake and Fire